All right. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, this is part three of the Tokyo Zookeeper adventure that we're on together. Um, just to mention it again, because I do every time, uh, I'm John. I do a bunch of these open source streams. Um, this is one of the more advanced, this is like a later part of a more advanced stream. Um, you can find them all on my Patreon page or on my Twitter page, or if you look at um, YouTube, uh, my account there, there's a playlist of all the different Rust videos that I've made. Uh, what we're doing in this particular instance is we're building Tokyo Zookeeper. So the idea is to build an asynchronous crate that allows you access to uh, an Apache Zookeeper instance. So Zookeeper, you can think of sort of as a key value store, um, except it's highly, um, highly consistent. You can have multiple servers running and they will all give consistent responses. Uh, we're writing this in Rust. Um, I recommend that if you have not seen the first parts of this video, um, then you go look at the... Um, uh, look at the original or the, the YouTube playlist and look at the previous parts before you watch this one. Otherwise, this one is unlikely to make much sense. Um, and so from this point forward, I'll assume that you've at least seen parts of the previous videos and that you're somewhat familiar with Rust. Uh, if at any point you have questions uh, during the stream, then feel free to ask them in chat and I'll try to monitor that on the side um, and answer them as we go. Uh, do you know how to get Rust 2018 async functions working with Tokyo? Um, you can't quite yet because Tokyo is still built with uh, Future 0 0.1. Uh, there's a bit of discussion about exactly how this is going to pan out um, because a bunch of modifications are needed to bring it up to speed and it's going to be backwards incompatible in some weird way. So uh, you can't currently use async functions with, with Tokyo, sadly. Uh, but hopefully in not too long. Um, so the place we left off last time was that we have basically all of Tokyo working, like we can interact with a running to uh, Zookeeper instance. Uh, the API is not particularly exciting so far. I don't remember if we push this to docs.rs. Um, uh, Zookeeper, I don't think so. Yeah, okay. Um, but the API is pretty straightforward. You can call exists, you can delete, you can insert. Um, I don't think we implemented get, so that's the first thing we'll implement today. Um, and then we'll add support for watches that are not the global watcher. So if you remember from previously, in fact, if we look at the um, documentation for the synchronous Zookeeper client that exists today, um, so notice that for basically all of the methods, there is a there is an exist thing that takes a, um, a boolean of whether to watch it or not, and if this is true, then a watch event is sent to the global watcher that was passed in when you initially connect to Zookeeper or create the Zookeeper client. There's also an exist w, so it's, notice that this is also the case for get children, get data, um, and various other methods um, where you pass in a watcher, and this watcher will be notified if this thing changed. Uh, so you have a choice of either making it the Boolean one or the, uh, or, or sorry, the either make it the global watcher that's notified or no watcher, of course, uh, or uh, some watcher, some one shot watcher that you give it. Um, so adding watcher, this style of watchers is something we'll also add today. And then hopefully we'll also get to the ability to connect to multiple Zookeeper servers, which is not currently something we support. Um, to build on that uh, here, um, I find this, sorry for the, the suddenly white background. Um, I found a FAQ for Zookeeper that talks about how you should handle things like connection loss and session expired, and especially how that interacts with multiple servers. So that might be something that comes in handy. It's a little annoying actually to, to test this because Zookeeper doesn't really, it's a little annoying to run multiple instances on one machine. Um, so we'll see if we get to this and if we get to it, whether we get to test it. And if we haven't tested it, then arguably it doesn't work, even if we think it does. Um, there's also the Zookeeper Java API that we're going to be referring to a bunch. If you look at the, um, uh, the documentation here, you notice that it has a similar pattern to the Rust crate in that there's a, an exists that has a Boolean and there's an exists that take a watcher. Um, here, there's a, also a synchronous version and an asynchronous version. For us, all of these will be asynchronous. Um, and so we'll take a look at that. Someone also pointed out after the last stream, they had some questions about whether we're breaking linearizable semantics, given that we're using an asynchronous implementation. So linearizable se semantics, the idea is that um, if you perform 
uh, well, there are many definitions of this, but the general idea of the property is that if you perform one operation and you perform another operation later in time, um, they should be uh, they should be visible in that order too. So if you if you do something to Zookeeper and then you do something else to Zookeeper strictly later in time, like after the first one completed, then you should make sure that all your reads should be consistent with the operations having happened in that order. And this person has a, a question about whether this also applies when we have asynchronous implementations. Um, you can read the discussion here. We haven't quite come to a, a resolution yet because I'm not quite sure way where they believe the the issue arises um, but this might also be something worth keeping an eye on um, I also found the Java implementation that has a lot of the client code I haven't had a chance to read through it yet but there are some interesting comments here that we can um, we can look at in terms of processing things in order we probably won't do that in the stream uh, but this might be a good way to sort of compare the Java and rust implementations and see that we do things correctly. So if you recall from last time, there was some discussion about how when you get disconnected, which servers you choose to connect to, that the client library has some like thundering herd prevention. And so some of this we might be able to lift from the Java library. Um, but it, that might become relevant today, but it's unclear. Um, but the place we're going to start is to implement get data, because if you can't get data, then what are you even really doing with Zookeeper? So let's pull up our da, 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 our library here. So for, sorry, let me make this a little bit larger. So for Zookeeper, remember we have connect, which gives you a new Zookeeper instance. Uh, we, we added create, we added exists, and we added delete. We don't yet have a, have a get. Now we believe the get should be pretty straightforward to add. So let's just check that now. Um, it'll also be a good way to just refresh our memory of how the system works. Um, so we're gonna have a, I don't know if, if I want to call it get data, uh, maybe. Um, so this get children is also a useful operation in Zookeeper. And we might want both of these. Uh, get children gives you the names of or the the names of all the nodes that are underneath you. So in Zookeeper, you um, essentially construct a hierarchy of nodes, um, similar to sort of a file system almost. And so you can get the children of a given node. And get data gives you the contents of a given node. Um, and so let's start off with get get children. Why not? I think they'll basically end up being the same. Uh, get children. Oh yeah, the other thing we'll do today, uh, just because it's going to be necessary in order for this library to be even remotely usable, is we'll try to incorporate a bunch of the documentation from the Java code into this. Um, it shouldn't be too hard. It's just important to do, and we'll. S hopefully while doing that also um, observe if there are any mistakes we've made along the way or if our API doesn't actually conform to what the, the Zookeeper API is supposed to be. All right, so get children. Um, we're gonna ignore this watch parameter for now. So the way we're gonna end up doing watch, um, we've already added it to exists as a Boolean because remember we tested this last time. I think what we'll want to do is actually remove it from exists and then have a pub exists watch. Um, which takes like a, well, actually it might not, well, it's a little unclear how we'll do this, um, but it'll take something like a self and a watcher, which is going to be an option watcher. And so the idea here is that if you want to use the global watcher, you would call exists watch with none. Um, but that's a discussion for slightly later in the stream. Um, for get children though, the only parameter then is path because we're going to ignore watchers for now. Uh, so similar to many of the other API endpoints. And like all the other ones, we're going to return something that is a future that contains both self, so the client itself, um, and some kind of result. In our case, of course, the result is going to be a vec string, so a list of all of the child nodes' names, um, and an error get children, which we haven't added yet. So if you remember this pattern from last time, um, the item of the stream is the client and a result in the sense of whether the given operation succeeded or failed. So this, um, this vec here, this OK value of this result is known as the item of the future. So this is the future resolved correctly and the operation gave you an OK or the operation gave you a, an error. Right? So this would be you try to delete a node that doesn't exist, for example. 
the error case, so if the future results with an error, what that means is there was a protocol, le uh, protocol le la, level error of some kind. Um, and those we want to expose separate, separately from just your operation failed. If there's a protocol level, level error, then it might be that your connection has been severed. It might be that like, it's unclear that you can keep using the same client. You might have to start a new one. Whereas if only the operation failed, then you only really care about how that operation failed. So if we look back at error, um, notice here that for delete, for example, we only expose specifically the errors that are possible to get with delete so that the user can match of them uh, as necessary. Uh, so let's see. So if we get children, we get the client back and a list of children. There's going to be some kind of uh, error for create children. Uh, children. Ah. Children. Um, similar to all the other errors, these are also going to derive all these nice things, and we'll have to figure out exactly what kind of errors can occur when you do um, not. That should be get children. Uh, what kind of errors can occur when you get children? Um, and for as for what get children does, um, I mean the exact definition is pretty straightforward. Um, if you recall, the way that we issue requests is we have this um, packetizer that runs as a spawned future in the background, and we have a channel to it that we, on that channel, we send a request and a response channel. Um, and so what the packetizer does is it's in this loop where it uh, sends requests out on the wire, receives responses asynchronously, and sends on all the stored, um, stored reply channels um, whenever the response comes in. And so in this case, um, if you look at proto mod, uh, we have this enqueue, which is what's given to the client. The enqueue method takes a request and returns something that is a future that will resolve into the, the result of that request. And internally, all it does is it creates a one-shot channel and sends both the request and the transmit end of that channel to the other side, and then returns the response end, which will be resolved whenever the response comes in. Um, so in our case, what we want to send here is we want to send a get children request. Um, and we're gonna do the same thing as we've done in the past here, where we'll lift this from here, uh, actually from, I want this file open too. Yeah, so get children is the opcode. So now we're gonna have to go through all of these um, all these steps of adding all the various enum variants for this operation. So here, for request, it can currently be a connect, exist, delete, or create. And now, of course, it can also be a get children request. Uh, we don't exactly know what that contains yet. Uh, in fact, we should probably find out get children. Uh, so a get children request is a string and bool. So string and bool, just as in uh, the same thing exists is. Um, the reason it's a string and bool is because it also has this watch flag, um, which we will always set to zero when we send it currently because we are not also doing watchers quite yet for these operations. So it'll really just be the path and watch, which we'll just set to zero. Uh, and it's going to start warning us that we haven't implemented all these. We'll do those with compiler warnings because it's nicer. Here we'll set watch to be zero because we don't want to watch the get children. The response we get back, that's a good question. So get children response looks like it is just a vec of string uh, here. So that just reads an i32 and then those things. Okay, so just like we added a variant to request, we'll also have to add one to response. Um, in this case, response here is gonna be a uh, children. It's gonna be a vector string. Actually, how about we just do this? Because that might be usable for other methods too. Um, and we all already have this well, maybe we don't have that yet. Hmm. So uh, we need a way to parse vectors that come back. It sort of looks from this implementation as though the only thing that gets a vector back is um, get children, but that sounds a little weird. 
So I think what we'll do is um, we'll implement read from for vec string. Uh, and here again, we can just sort of lift this um, this implementation because they're all basically the same. Like the protocol level is the same, right? So in this case, we want to read an i32, which is going to be the um, uh, the number of things allocate a vector with that capacity, and then read that many strings, and then return. Okay, it is. Hmm? Uh, nope. So. Great. Uh, because now, down here, if what we sent was a request response, then the response is going to be a strings, uh, and then a reader dot, no, a vec. Well, how do we want to do this? Vec string from a read from a buff. Like so. Right, so the idea is that if we get in a, um, if we get in a, or if the thing we sent to the server was a request, then parse the response as a vec of strings using the read from trait that we just implemented and then wrap that in a strings response. Uh, expected vec found bool. That uh, doesn't sound right. Oh no. Oh, I updated my nightly. Oh well, I'll have to wait for that for a little bit. Um, that's interesting. Why? So apparently it doesn't like this because, oh, this should be reader. It still complains. Maybe this, but I don't think that should be necessary. From expected mute found U8. Oh, right, 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 right. For, for so a, um, the read trait is only implemented for mutable pointers to slices so that as you read, you can change how far into it you've read. Um, whereas reader here is just a buff, which is um, just a slice of U8s. Now, no variant named request. Yes, this should be get children. So if the request was a get children is what it should have said, then parse response is a vector of strings. Now that should be happy. Uh, we don't need version here, that can go away. Um, and now we know that the response should be a strings children, then resolve to children. If we get something else, got non strings response to get children. This is one of those things where we've mentioned this in past streams too, but we're in this unfortunate place where the response we get is also an enum. And even though we know that we can't get anything that's not a strings response to get children, we have to handle that case because we need to exhaustively match. Um, and so what we do here is if we get a response that is not of the correct type, we just panic. Um, in theory, we could return like a protocol level error here, right? Like resolve this into an error. And that might actually be the right thing to do, come to think of it. Um, yeah. In fact, maybe we should just do that. I don't really like having unreachables that aren't actually unreachable. They should be unreachable, right? In the common case, but we don't really want panics in our code. So I think what we'll do is change this to a bail. So bail comes from the failure crate and is basically a uh, return error uh, format error. And then whatever you give it, uh, where format error is the thing that creates a failure error. So in our case, we'll do this. Uh, like so. Um, this is 
going to be like so. Ooh, did not like that. What did I do wrong? Oh. Hmm. This should be OKR. So, uh, this. I'm basically just changing all of the. Uh, all of the unreachables to be bales. So they won't actually panic. The user will get to the user will get to choose how they want to handle that kind of error. Like so I think that's all of them. Uh, okay, so in response to get children, we know that we should get a strings and we handle that case. If we get something else that was not an error, then it must have been the wrong return type. What other responses can we get to get children? is the real question. Uh, ooh, where did we use to get this? Um, where's the, da, 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 not here, not there. Where is it? Here. So get children is the one we want to look at. So let's see. Not sorted, no guarantees provided, no node if the path does not exist. Okay, so no node is something we can get, right? So that's something we want to let the user match on because it's a, an error that can totally come up, um, which is not terribly surprising. This is the case for most of the Zookeeper operations. What else can we get? Um, looks like that's actually the only one. Right, so not empty is not an error we can get, bad version is not one we can get, node exists won't be a problem, no children for ephemerals, apparently can't be raised, invalid ACL doesn't apply. So the only thing you can really get with get children is no node. Um, doesn't implement display, that is not true anymore. Um, and so any other error is unexpected. Right, um, any error that is not no node is not one that you should be that it should be possible to get with get children, um, and so at this point it's unclear whether this should even be a result. Um, it could just be an option, like so. Uh, then this would be an okay sum, and this would be an okay none, and then we don't need this error. Type. Right, so it's a result. It's a it's an enum with only one variant, where the variant does not contain any information, which is basically the same as an option. So what we're saying here is, if you try to get children of a node does not, that does not exist, you would get none, which seems totally reasonable. Let's um, be consistent about naming, and that should be basically it. What is it complaining about here? Oh, did I mess up syntax somewhere? Uh, I did, but where? Here, this is missing a thing. There we go. All right, so we can add this to our ever-growing um, test case down here of saying like so. So in theory, we would create a node then under foo, like so, foo slash bar. I guess we'll do that after all the exist calls. And then we'll do this. Right, so we in our test, we first create a slash foo, we check that it exists and whatnot, and now we're creating a bar under foo with some different contents. And then we want to check both. Well, actually, we don't really care about the exists as much. Um, what we do, however, care about is, uh, well, that should have created foo bar. And then we want to do get children of foo, right? And we would inspect what we get back, children, 
and we want to assert that uh, children is a sum vec uh, bar. It's a good question. Exactly what it'll return, but in theory that should work fine. And then we have to delete bar. I mean, we could also test that deleting foo does not succeed. So in, in Zookeeper, you're not allowed to delete a node that has children. And so in this case, we would expect to get an error back. And that error is going to be a uh, delete not empty, right? So we're basically trying to, we're, we check that foo indeed got the new bar child. Um, we try to delete foo. We should get an error that says it's not empty. We then delete foo bar, which should work, and then we should delete foo, which should work. So if I now start zookeeper, um, and then run turbo t, oh, it's probably, s does it not compile? I think we have all the components we need. Could be wrong. Let's see, 203. It's complaining that it can't compare. Uh, a reference to an option with an option. How about now? Uh, request 109. Okay, so here, this is one of those places where Rust pattern matching saves us. We forgot to say how to encode a create request. Um, and we happen to know that a re create request is serialized exactly the same as a exist request. Sorry, a get children request. It's exactly the same as an exist request, right? They both just take a path and a watch flag. Uh, and then we want to, ooh. Well, this one's a little tr tricky because we want to write a different off code. It might be cleaner to just have them be separate. Um, so I guess let's do that. It's like unclear there's a big advantage to sharing those two lines when we also need to add a match on self again to write out the correct opcode. Um, all right, now what does it complain about? Uh, 159, opcode. It doesn't know what the mapping from a request to an opcode is. We can tell it that pretty easily. All right, let's see what happens. Well, that worked. So in theory, let's see if we can find this. So up here, this is remember, we're doing a lot of logging internally that we'll probably want to turn off too. Or um, actually that might be a good idea. What we could do is use the um, S log crate or some other logging crate and actually have all of this be proper logging. Um, that might make our lives a lot easier. Um, so we create bar, and then this is request for foo, which gets a response. This looks a lot like bar in ASCII. So that would be my guess that that is bar. Um, so then we handle the get children, and then we do delete foo, which gives the error. Then we delete again foo bar. Okay, great. So that seems to just have worked. And notice how little we had to do. Like, this is extremely straightforward. Um, so let's then try to add, I guess, get data. I'm a little bit tempted to just call it get. But let's stick with get data for now. Um, what is in, what's the, this calls it get data. Okay. And, oh, interesting. Okay, so get data just takes a path and a watch, similar to the other ones, but it also takes a stat. Oh, that's interesting. I'm not sure why a stat is passed in. That doesn't make any sense to me. Like, why is that here not a Boolean? Oh, I guess it returns byte. And so this is like a reference to a stat that will be updated. Okay, so there's a, 
so the way to think about this is there are two variants of get data. One is get just the contents of the node, and one is get the contents of the node and its sort of meta information. So let's look at here, um, get data request. Huh, get data request just takes a path on a watch, just like the others. Get data response always returns the stat. Okay, so it sounds a little bit like it is just a more convenient API. Um, that seems odd. I guess here another question is whether, um, where's the here? So if we get data, what kind of errors can we get? Only no node. Okay, so option is still gonna work pretty well. Um, in this case though, what you're gonna get back is a vec of u8s, right? Um, here is one of those places where it's a little sad that we can't just like slice out the u8 that we got off the wire. We have to actually copy all the data. Um, it's a little sad. Um, the fact that there's a stat though means that sort of in theory, this is also this. Uh, I don't remember where we put stat in types, okay. So it's sort of a tuple of the bytes that are contained within the node and the, the meta, meta information about the node. And we can, the, basically what they've, the decision they've made in the Java API is to have two different methods. One that you call if you want just the bytes and one that you call if you want both. Um, I wonder what the Rust one has. Get data just returns the tuple. Yeah, I think we'll do the same. There's no reason for us to remove the stat. So I think we'll just do that. Um, and this is going to be get data. So again, notice how straightforward these are now to implement because we spent so much time in part one, especially building a nice API for the packetizer and that's paying off now, right? Um, so the response should be a get data response, which is going to contain bytes and, and stat. And we're gonna return bytes and stat. So, um, got non data response to get data. So these are all basically the same, right? Like in response to a get data, we would expect to get a get data response. If we don't, then something is wrong on the wire. Um, in terms of errors, we can get no node. That's an expected result. Any other error is unexpected and we propagate that as a protocol level error. And then we'll have to do the same thing here. So there's now a new request type, which is get data. Also takes a path and a string. Um, we might as well also add this. At this point, it might actually be worth to, even though it looks like a lot of these are actually the same. Um, hmm. Because like this is going to be, get data is going to look exactly the same. Get children, I think we'll just, we'll do this after all, change my mind. Given that get data is also the same. Um, and so the way we do this is we match on self. Um, I guess select opcode is equal to this. And then actually we already have a method that does that. So we can just do here self dot opcode, right? I think so. And now that will be the same for all of them, right? So get data, get children exists, all have the same contents. So their serialization is the same. And we call self opcode to get the opcode to write out, which does have to vary between the requests. Well, that looks good. Um, of course, we have to map get data to get data. Some sort of fine. Uh, we now know that there's a new type of response, which is a get data response which has bytes, uh, actually, I guess this is gonna be a bytes and stat, it's gonna be a struct. Uh, bytes, which is gonna be a vec of u8s, just the byte contents of the file and a stat. And then down here, down here, uh, get data. And now of course the question is, 
how is the response structured? Get data response, it has a data first and then the stat. Um, and evacuate, my guess is evacuate is something that we can parse pretty efficiently. In fact, we already have a thing for doing that, right? So that's this that we implemented a while ago, um, where read buffer just gives you a vec of u8s. Um, and so we're going to do bytes is reader dot read buffer, right? And stat is stat read from reader. So we notice that the order is important, even though we could do this, like they're sort of the same in terms of defining the struct, but we actually do have to read out first the buffer, then the stat, because that's the order they are in in the response. Um, and this should be a get, this produces a get data response. How does that sound? Beautiful. So notice that that's all we had to do. Now we have get data in theory, right? And now we're gonna try to test that by calling get data on foo. And that's gonna return us a bytes and a stat. And we want to assert that uh, the bytes, oh, actually, I guess this is going to be a response. And we're going to, res is unwrappable, as in we don't expect to get none, we get, expect to get some. Oh, actually, we could even do better than this, I think. We could do... The data length is actually the data is going to be this, right? And then we're going to assert equal the response to. Um, oh no, that's going to be annoying. Uh, we're going to assert that rest. Well, we're going to make sure it's sum. So this unwrap would fail, which is what we want. We expect it to be sum. And then we're going to check that rest dot zero, which is bytes, is the same as data. And we're going to assert that rest dot one, which is the stat dot data length, is data dot length. Right? And then I guess we could do the same thing with uh, down here with food bar, not that we expect that to be any different, but we might as well have the test for it. And let's see how that does. Fantastic. So now we have get data. Notice how straightforward that was. I promised last stream that it would be straightforward to add and indeed it was straightforward to add. If we look at here, this is the response we get back, right? So uh, somewhere around here, yeah, this is, this is hello bar, right? Uh, nine characters, H-E-L-L-O space B-A-R. And then the rest here is the stat. And similarly, up here somewhere, we should have uh, get data for foo, which gets the response here. 11 characters, hello space, so 32 is space, um, and then world. Great, so now we have get data and get children. Great. Uh, let's... Uh, Commit that while we're at it. Uh, add get commands. All right, so now the time is to add more sophisticated watchers. Now, there are a couple of ways we could do this. Um, we could add a separate version of each of these methods uh, where that separate function. Um, you pass in an optional watcher and that like that's totally something we could do it makes me a little sad because it means that you end up with a pattern like this where you for every method you have both that method and that method with an underscore w or some other similar kind of um, uh, similar kind of pattern one thing that I like doing instead uh, is to have something like this. Um, this is 
time do I still run anything? No, I don't think so. So that's going to take a W. I guess this can take a W maybe. Something like this. So we're going to have some some uh, auxiliary data structure. It's going to be this uh, and watcher or and watch, uh, which is going to contain a zookeeper and a watcher. And on and watch, we add all the same methods that we have on the main structure. Uh, so there's going to be, oh, well, I guess, unimplement, unimplemented. We'll have the same for delete. And we'll have the same for get data. Right? So the reason for writing the pattern this way is now if a user wants to not watch something, they'll do like they'll have the zookeeper and do get data and they give some path. Right? So that's all fine. If they want to start watching that, then they will do uh well. I guess the exact naming of this will be a little weird, but they could do something like this. Right? Where this is a watcher. Uh, we're using a trade watchable or something like that with some default method, so it's extensible for all the interactions. Um, not entirely sure what you're thinking. So the, the problem we have is that the... Well, we could change the return type of all the methods to be something that the user can then call like dot and watch on. The problem is that um, if they don't call and watch, like we, we wouldn't know when to issue the request is the issue, right? So if imagine that um, get data returned like a, um, uh, like a watch or not, we call it whatever we want. And then now, the user like stores this in an X, right? The question is when this request gets sent, because we can't send the request yet because we don't know whether or not it should be watched. So the user, if they wanted to watch, would do something like and watch whatever, right? And at that point, now we could send the request. Ah, ooh, not what I meant. Um, at that point, we could totally send the request, but what if the user doesn't want to add a watcher, right? They would have to do something like x dot send or something, which is a little awkward. I, I wouldn't want them to have to do that. And then the send is what would return the, the future that they then wait on, right? Uh, which would lead to real, really weird patterns like dot wait, right? Whereas in this case, if we have the watch precede get data, then now this is still going to return the future just like in the API above. And if you don't want to do the watcher, the pattern is the same. Right, get data just returns you a future, um, and so that's why I don't want this to be a property of the return value of get data, but rather by the time you call get data, it is fully determined whether or not you have a watcher. Of course, this is also something you could do with this, right? If get if there was a get data w, then this has the same semantics that the moment get data w is called, you know whether or not there's a watcher. Uh, it's a Right. So I think there's going to be a watch, which is you want to use the global watcher. Mm. Well, I think actually this needs to not be parameterized over W. Uh, so this is going to be a none. It's going to be a sum. And we're going to have to box this up somehow. 
right? So the, the way this is actually going to work behind the scenes on the protocol level is um, Zookeeper doesn't know about the fact that you might have many watchers. Actually, this is going to get really awkward. So the, the, way, the way watchers work in Zookeeper, if you want to have more than just the global watcher that's notified of all events, um, is that you just keep track of the paths. So if a, if a notification comes in for a path, you check for any watcher that may be watching that path. And then you send to all of them. Um, which is a little weird. Because, it, because here, the watch doesn't know the path yet. Um, oh, but it, it will know the path though because the, those methods will be called on and watch, right? Right, so here, once we get here, we have the path. And so then we could register it. So the, the basic idea is we're going to um, register with the global watcher the fact that there's now an additional watcher they should notify for this given path. Um, so we're going to have to figure out the pattern. But I think this is how we want this to be set up. Um, huh. Yeah. I think so. Hmm. Yeah. The the way this is gonna have to work is something like. Ooh, actually, here's what we'll do. Uh, well, we'll find a better name for it later. So we don't want to re-implement all of these methods either, right? And so what I want to do is have this be something like uh, and watch with like watch or none dot get data. And then I want all the implementation of all these methods to only be in the watcher. Because otherwise, we have to duplicate them between the two, right? Which is annoying. Um, and so I think the, for us to do that, we're going to need an enum that has something like, uh, how would you like to watch this call? And the, the options are like none, uh, global, or uh, like. how we want a particular, I don't know how to, I mean, we could call it local, but it's not really local. So there's a global watcher, there's no watcher, as in you don't want to watch the call, and there's custom. And custom, I think is going to be, I don't think we want watch settings to be parameterized. So, there's, it's sort of tempting to do this, right? And make it generic over F. The problem then is what do you set F to if you're giving it a none or a global? I guess if we don't have any trait bounds on it, it might be okay. Um, sure, we'll try it and see what happens. Uh, I think this is going to get really weird, but I guess we'll find out. Um, so that takes a watch settings W. And now the idea would be that if you call watch, it's going to create an and watch. I don't really want it to be called and watch because the user is going to see one of these, right? Like when they call watch, they're going to get back some type. Oh, actually, no, that's fine. So they will only ever see it in the context of watching. They won't see that it's being used for exists. So I think this is okay. Uh, so that gives you an and watch where zookeeper is self, self, uh, and watcher is like watch settings none, sorry, global, right? So this means that if the user does something like zk.watch.getData, 
um, of foo. Yeah. Then the global watcher will be notified of that. I think that that looks pretty nice, right? And then the alternative for watch with is going to be something like watch with, and they're going to give some f uh, that I don't know, does like a print line f or something. It's not terribly important. Uh, dot get data foo. Then now if um, if the data of foo changes, then this closure will be called. And also the global watcher is, I think, always called. Not sure actually. I think it is always called. We should check this um, exactly what the watcher protocol here is. Uh, watches. Uh, one watch when the data is changed. Yep. Uh, well, this doesn't really answer the question. Well, I can't connect to the server. Uh, uh, it doesn't really say. A client will never see a change for which it has a set watch until it first sees the watch event. That's fine. Watch is ordered. Um, these watches are one-time triggers. That's fine. The same watch object is registered for an exist and a get data. The watch object will only be invoked once with the delete and notification for the file. Okay, so they are only sent once. So the so if you have, well, it doesn't quite answer the question either. But I think what this means is uh, the watch, if the same watch object is registered for two calls, then it will only be invoked once. Well, that's sort of interesting. I guess it depends whether we're expecting these to be closures or whether we're expecting these to be some kind of like global objects. Um, so for watch, sorry, for watch with, are we expecting users to call like self dot watch with uh, like event and then some closure dot get data, uh, get data foo, or are we expecting them to watch with and then pass in like a custom watcher, right? Where custom watcher is reused across many of these. I think it's the former because you can encapsulate the latter pattern in the former, but not the other way around. Well, actually, you could do it the other way around too. I think we want to do it this way, and then the user can choose whatever they want to do. And so in that case, the question then becomes, um, if we get a watch event, we notify all of the watchers for that path, so that's fine. Do we also notify the global watcher? I think so, but I don't have a good answer for that. I think we do. Let's assume that we do. Um, all right. So this takes a this makes one of those. That's fine. Uh, this makes a watch settings uh, custom watcher. And then uh, local cell. Uh, well, this is not going to be public. This is what all the other methods are going to call. They're going to call uh, I guess. Well, I, I just want a shortcut for these methods are all going to have to do something like and watch none dot exists path, right? And I just want a shortcut for the inner part here, um, which I think we're just gonna call like no watch. We'll find a better, 
the better name for it. This now has to be parameterized by the W, I think. Uh, it's a little awkward. No, let's not do that. These don't have to be high performance anyway. Uh, in which case, this can be a box new. Um, where W, oops, where W is an FN once from, well, that's a good question. What's our watcher type again? Um, it's a stream, right? It just gives a watched event. So the FN once is given a watched event, which hopefully is clone. Otherwise, we have a problem. Watch event is clone. All right. Um, and it returns nothing, right? So we're basically saying the user gives us a closure that's going to be given the event that happened and can do whatever it wants with it. Uh, no watch does nothing. Uh, like so. And exists is just going to be self dot no watch dot exist path and then remove the exists implementation into the and watch exists right and now this is going to be the watch here is going to be if uh, let watch settings uh, none is equal to self dot w then zero, otherwise one. So if we're not watching, then give a zero, otherwise give a one. Apart from that, the implementation is the same, right? And then we'll do the same for all the other methods. So for delete, will be this. Uh, delete and version. These go down here. Actually, no, I guess, I guess delete doesn't really have this because you can't watch a delete. So I think this, we're gonna hoist that up here. You might want to make these two different dimple blocks actually, um, just for our own sanity's sake. So we'll have one dimple block of things that can't be watched and one of things that can be watched. Um, so exists as that. Uh, get children does this. So notice how these are all basically the same, right? Uh, and the condition under which they watch is also the same. Uh, delete won't be here. And then I guess get data is the last one. So get data will be the same. Get data like here and those. Right, so now we have at least the, um, uh, this is not W anymore, and this is not F anymore, and this is, I guess, a box FN ones watch event to nothing. Probably has to be send, but uh, what's this exactly for a game or? No, this is a programming. This is not Rust the game. This is Rust the programming language. Um, this uh, confusion comes up roughly twice every stream. Um, let's see. Right, so this does not take a watch settings. Uh, these will all have to be self.zk. Uh, so. Of course, this only sort of works because currently, uh, if we set watch to one, all that will happen is that the global watch will be triggered. We will put Go language too much. <laughs> um, right, so, so currently this will only ever trigger the global watcher because we're not storing this custom watcher anywhere. So what we're going to want is something like a FN register watcher that's gonna take a path and a watch settings path is going to be a string yeah uh, 
I guess if we want to make this really convenient, we do this. I'll explain why in a second. Um, so this will uh, return ZK. Uh, this is going to have to do something to register W with uh, whatever dispatches events, right? So that's all well and good. Uh, this is then going to do something like let ZK itself dot register watcher uh, path and actually this doesn't even need to take a W. Um, so the, this is the reason why I wanted this to be um, why I wanted this to return zookeeper because it means that we can do the the destructuring here because otherwise here would have to do something like register this. Uh, and then we'd have to give self dot w, but we want to move self dot w out of self. And then I guess we could use zk here. It'd still be fine, but this just reads a lot cleaner. Um, and so this will now use zk. Uh, I guess zk dot connection. And then we'll do the same for all the others. Right, so all of them are gonna somehow register the watcher. We haven't defined how yet, and then they're gonna issue the request. This is complaining for some reason. This is complaining for some reason. Uh, why? Not sure why that is complaining. Expected type and watch, fountain zookeeper. Oh, right, this does have to. Right, right, right. Uh, self here is a different type. Self here is and watch, but we really wanted to return back to the zookeeper type. We can't use self anymore uh, in the ones that are on and watch. Like so. Uh, and this is going to be zk. ZK and ZK. Right. <clears throat> right, so the question now is, how are we gonna register these watchers? So if you remember, the way the global watcher is set up is when you first connect, you're given a future that will resolve into a tuple of a zookeeper client and a stream, and that stream is over all watched events. Um, and that stream, is given to us by the packetizer, I think. Uh, maybe I'm wrong. Oh yeah, I am wrong. Uh, the stream is actually generated here. So really what we want to keep track of is like, instead of having these, uh, instead of just directly exposing the stream, we want to sort of interpose on the global event channel and any events that match paths that we've stored, we want to dispatch to that too. Um, it's not entirely clear how we're going to do that, though. Huh. That is a very good question. Because basically, somehow, whenever we receive on this global event stream, we want that notification to also go elsewhere. The alternative, of course, is instead of doing this in Zookeeper, we do it in Packetizer. So this... Uh, this registration that we do, wait, why is this complaining? W does not count, static. Um, uh, this no longer take watch, so that's nice. It's sort of what we wanted to get rid of. And this, wait, why is this complaining? Uh, right, this has to do something like watch, I guess that's uh, awkward. This also has to return whether or not it should uh, let's just make this true for now. 
uh, we need to have something to match on here, right? So this is going to be something like if watch then one, otherwise zero, and that's going to be the same for all of them. Because we've uh, we've moved self dot w in when we did the register path, so this is arguably the reason not to do that. But all right, uh, and this is going to be this and watch, and the same up here. All right, uh, yeah. So the thing we could do here um, is. We could send the watcher to the packetizer and have the packetizer do the work of also dispatching to other things. I think that might be the easiest way to go, actually. So we would do something like zk.connection. Oh, that's a sync, isn't it? The enqueuer. Hmm. So what I was thinking was. Uh, on and cure to have a method that's not in queue, but like send watcher or something that would send that onto the uh, onto the the channel that the um, that the packetizer is listening on. However, the stuff we send there has to take this form, right? So we would sort of have to we'd have to have some kind of enum that is the kind of stuff you could send. It's probably the nicest way to do it, though. So we'll, we'll just do that. Um, so it's going to be uh, enum uh, task. Let's call it task. So it's going to be uh, request, which is going to take a, well, a request and a response, right? So that's going to be that. Or a task can be an add watcher, which is then going to take a path and a, ooh. Actually, we don't even have to register the watcher if it's for the global one, because the global one will, will always be notified regardless. So I think this is going to be something like if let, uh, well, actually, let's just match on W. So if we get a watch settings none, then we just return ZK and true and false, right? We don't even want to add a set watch to one. If we get a global, then we can just return true. All we really need to do is set the watch flag to true, and then the, the event will be propagated correctly. It is only if we get a custom w uh, that we need to do some stuff and then at the end also return um, and then also return true so that we set the flag to be uh, to be one right so I think this is what we're gonna have to do and then we're gonna have to figure out what to do in between here and the idea that we're working with is that we're gonna do something like send uh, or add watcher path to string and w right so we're going to send to the the packetizer the watcher and the path that we want to register that watcher for uh, right and so add watcher is going to take a path string and a like notify ooh Hmm. So instead of the other way we could go about this is instead of passing a closure that gets called, like a callback, we could have it return a future instead. So currently we're going to end up with this like fn1's watched event to nothing plus static. Well, actually, the static is necessary. But like currently, we're going to end up with this, right? And notify is going to be called as the watcher. The alternative would be that when you call when you call watch, or actually when you call watch with, what it returns is the thing that you're going to call a method on, and also the future that will resolve when that thing tracker um, triggers. That might be better. 
Uh, so how would we even express this? Right, so, so the proposal is that this returns this. Uh, launch event and uh, error, I guess, is nothing. Uh, error is, yeah, error is nothing. So instead of it taking a watcher, it's just going to do this. That does look a, a lot nicer and sort of more in spirit with the asynchronous world. The question is what to call it. Uh, because I sort of want this to be called like notify and this to be called watch. But that's also a little odd, right? Because this is just saying like also notify the global watcher whenever something happens. This is give me a watcher. So maybe with the watcher and this is just watch. It's all a little bit awkward. I don't quite know how to reconcile these. Um, but the, the basic idea is going to be we create a one shot. Uh, is, do we have one shot somewhere here? No. OK, so we're going to use future sync one shot. Um, so this is going to create a new one shot channel. And the custom is going to contain the transmit end. And then we're going to return aw and rx, like so. Right, so now what the what the user gets back is, is both the things that are going to call the method on and the future that will resolve when the watch event triggers. Um, I think that's what we want. It's, it's complaining about something, though. Oh, it's probably the error type is something else. The error type is up here somewhere. Futures canceled, which sounds about right. Right, like the, the error of that future is that the future was canceled, which I think is basically what we want. It does make the API a little bit more awkward because now you need to, you can't just do like dot with watcher dot get data right because you're gonna have to remove the future that got returned but i think this is still what we want and now this actually makes this a lot easier because now we know that this is a one shot sender uh watched event right and now this is a tx uh this is not a box anymore this is a one shot sender watched event. Like so. And then queuer is now going to have down here, it's going to have another method that's going to be add watcher. It's going to take a path that's a string and a TX, which is this one shot business. Right? It's not going to return anything. It is just going to do an unbounded send of uh, task add watcher path tx. Uh, like so I guess it's a little awkward that this unwraps currently, but. Uh, and this, of course, now has to be a task. So the things that we, the channel that we have to the, um, to the packetizer is now different, right? Uh, because now we're sending an enum instead of, um, instead of just a tuple like we were before. So this is going to be a request where the request and response is going to be TX like so. In theory, everybody's happy, except for whatever reason. Oh, this should be TX. And this is complaining because this is now a request. Uh, found. 
my task expected type oh no this is now a sender of tasks and it's complaining about that because it does not implement debug that's fine we can implement debug in fact we can no we can't implement clone but we can implement debug so now the packetizer actually has a channel here that is not this, but instead it gets task, right? And so now the main loop of the packetizer, where's our, uh, the thing that reads things from the channel, uh, let's see, it reads from the timer, doo -doo 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 -doo, poll NQ, Rx poll. This no longer gives an item TX. Instead, well, so now it can get either a task request, which has a request and a response. In which case we want to give back the request and the response just like before but in addition to this it can now get an add watcher which has a path and a tx so the question is what should it do here right so this is this is the packetizer gets told to add a new watcher what does that even mean um, the way we're going to implement this is basically it's going to keep a track of all the path paths that it's supposed to send things on uh, and then it's just going to send on them. Now, ooh. Uh, I'll deal with that in a second. Okay, so this is going to do something like self.watchers. I guess entry path. Dot or or, uh, or insert with back new. Dot push. So we're going to have watchers are going to be some kind of map from paths to um, from paths to a list of watchers to notify. Ooh, right. And then we're going to have to check that whenever we send out on the watcher. Right. So this default watcher. Uh, where do we end up using default watcher? Uh, is on here. This is an active packetizer, isn't it? Yeah. So I think watchers is going to have to be a field here. Like uh, watchers is going to be a. Let's make it a hash map for now. It might. We might want it to be a try eventually, but for now it's fine. Uh, it's going to be a vec of one shot senders of watched event, right? Uh, so the idea here is this is custom registered watchers path to TX. And so here, uh, watchers is going to be nothing by default. And then the the setup that we want is that whenever we're, whenever we receive an event, so down here, remember how XID equals one is a watch event that gets sent to us from the server? Then here, in fact, we already have a to-do for it. Do you do unit testing? Uh, there are very few tests in this library currently. In part, that's because Zookeeper is not particularly well built for testing. Um, but that's totally something that should be added, I agree. I have not been focusing on testing in this particular stream. Um, some of the earlier streams have some more focus on how to do testing. Um, right, so here, really what we want is, ah, it's going to be a little, so what is in a watched event? Path, nice. So if uh, e dot path, well, I guess, Here's really what we want to do. Um, let's 
um, watchers is self dot watchers dot get mute b dot path right uh, custom so in this case there are custom watchers for this path and so we need to notify them um, and so here for w in watchers in fact you might just want to remove this come to think of it that's not going to be correct, but let's leave it like this just for the for the time being. Uh, so the idea is that we're just going to loop over all the watchers, and for all of them, we're going to do w dot uh, send, and then a clone of the watch event. This belongs there. All right. So this is the basic pattern here. Makes sense that we have this like map of paths to watchers and whenever we get an event if we find that we have any watchers for that path and we also notify those watchers of the change right i think this should in theory be uh all oh, right uh this is actually going to be uh on the active packetizer it's also a little awkward because we're going to need um when we transition from active packetizer to reconnecting, we also sort of want to notify, well, dropping them is fine. Dropping them is just going to cancel them, which is basically the behavior we want. Uh, 485. FN once is not implemented for Beck. Oh, right. 354. Here too, we just ignore if there are errors. Uh, so here, um, one-shot senders are also not asynchronous in futures land. So if you send on a one-shot sender, it will never block, um, which is really neat because it means that we can do it in this loop and it won't actually be a problem. It won't cause us to go to sleep or anything. Um, you can see that if you go to documentation for future 0.1 we look at uh, sync one shot sender send and the only case in which we get an error is if the other side was dropped and that's why we just ignore the response uh, ignore the case where the receiver has been dropped right because we don't actually, that doesn't matter to us. Um, we still we still want to continue processing and there's nowhere we can send the error, so we just drop it. Um, now is it happy? All right. And now what we want to test is, let's just see that the, that the test that we had already will still pass, right? So remember, we have this setup where we, um, uh, we watch exists, right? So we're gonna change this to be zk dot, what do we call the thing? Watch, yeah, watch dot exists. Uh, and this is also gonna be watch dot exists. Um, and are there any other where we do this? Delete. Nope, I think that's all of them. No, down here. Watch. Just to see that the watch events still work the way we expect them to when, when we're using the global watcher. There's no big reason why it shouldn't, but it's nice to test. Um, and now we want to test that the, the localized stuff works too. So we're going to do this. Then we're going to do... Uh, well, I guess, where's our end then, this thing? So we're then going to call down here. Actually, let's do it the other way around. It's going to be a little bit easier. Uh, 
So we're gonna get a future and an exist watcher from calling, uh, well, what do we call this, with watcher? These names aren't great. Uh, exists foo, right? So keep, remember how, oh, sorry, with watcher foo dot exists foo dot and then uh, zk I guess we expect this to be that zk underscore zk watch exists foo. Uh, so I don't know if you follow that but the uh, with watcher returns us two futures right it returns us one future or it re returns us an and then or the an and watch which is going to be this few tier um, and that is where we continue calling exists and it also returns this other future that will resolve when this watcher triggers and we expect that to trigger here uh, oh, I, I guess we check all the watchers at the end currently but right here right here rather we expect that exists to have resolved right um, uh, where's the place where we get watch events down here somewhere yeah So the moment we do the create, we expect the exist w to resolve. And so we're going to check that right here. Uh, that that is not node deleted, but node created. I don't know if that if you follow that, that was a little bit fast. Uh, but the basic idea is that when we after we first connect, what we do now is we set up an exists with a custom watcher and that initial exists should return nothing for foo. And then we set up an exists with a, with a global watcher as well. And that should also return none. Then we create that should trigger both the global and the local watcher. And then we check that the, um, that the local watcher indeed has resolved, right? Uh, before we continue and then we go on with all the rest of the stuff. Exists. Ooh, I did not like that. Uh, error is failure error. Oh, right. Uh, this dot map error. So um, this entire path expects that the error types are failure errors, but for us the um, the error type here is canceled, right? Like the the event loop exited and you got no signal. Um, and so I hear I think we just want unreachable. We might as well uh, format error. It's actually nicer. Uh, got uh, or exists w failed uh, really 281 oh that needs to go here can't compare watched event and option watched event ooh is also right. Let's see how that fares. Beautiful. Okay, so this means that the the watcher we set up also correctly works, right? So this assertion worked correctly, uh, which means that the fu watch future we got back here indeed got triggered, and the global watcher also indeed got triggered. Um, so that's great. That means that the basic setup works, right? So, uh, but I don't want to commit it just yet because the current implementation actually has a bug um, that I just didn't tell you about. <laughs> and the reason for this is, 
uh, this business. So notice that there are a bunch of different types of watchers, right? So there's uh, created, deleted, changed, and child. Now, because triggers in Zookeeper are one shot, um, imagine that you call get data on some path, and you call exists on that same path, and then a created event comes in for that path. If that happens, the, in the current setup that we have, the created event would trigger get data or would trigger get children, right? Which is wrong, that should not, that should not actually happen um, because get data can't be triggered by a created. And so we actually need our map of watchers to keep track of, um, to keep track of the event type that's being requested to. Uh, and I believe that if you look at Rust Zookeeper, that is basically the same thing it does here. It has this watch type. Wait, why is that different from watch event type? How are these different? Uh, it seems pretty weird. What is uh, from const watched event type? I guess that's fine. Yeah, so that's why the the synchronous Rust Zookeeper has this enum called watch type is precisely to track these kind of changes. And so we could test this. We could add a, a check for this too by um, doing, I guess, a foo to Actually, it's a little annoying to do. Hmm. It's just a little awkward to chain these uh, with watcher calls, but not impossible. The, the reason it's annoying to chain is because, um, let's say that down here, I wanted to do a ZK dot with, uh, ZK dot with watcher. Um, Right. This is going to give me a the sort of the real future that I want to continue chaining, and the eventually thing for when the watcher. I guess we could call this watcher. Right, and then I sort of want to return watcher here. Sorry, return fut here. All right, fuse dot exists or whatever call I want to make. Right. The problem now is, of course, I've lost Watcher. I have no way to carry it along. And so that means that you have to annotate all of your futures with this, like, dot map, move, zk, zk, Watcher, right? All of these calls are going to have to chain the Watcher along until the point where you need it. Or you have to stick it in, like, a data structure you have access to somewhere, which is also a little bit annoying. Um, so I think... I don't think we're gonna do anything in particular with that now, but um, I wonder. I wonder, I wonder, I wonder. Um, so what I, what I was hoping to do was add a, add a part to this test where it will add something like a get data watcher and check that that data watcher does not get triggered. Uh, actually, looking at them again, though, is that even possible uh, here? So a changed event. OK, so I guess that would actually be the thing. The get children can only be triggered by a deleted event. But in our current setup, a change event would trigger get children. Similarly, a child event would trigger a get data, right? Which just seems wrong. Um, so we do have to keep track of this type. All right, might as well just do it. Um, where's my here? So in, where do we want this to even live? I think we want this to live in, oh, that's a good question actually. Proto maybe. Proto is already pretty large. I guess it'll be in Proto. That's fine. 
Right, so when we add a watcher down here, register watcher is going to take a path and a, uh, I don't know what to call it, uh, E type. It's going to be a watch, what do we call it? Uh, a watch type. So, uh, and when you add the watcher, you're gonna have to send the e-type along too. And now in proto, a task contains an e-type. I guess this really should be w-type, given that it's watch type. Uh, so this takes a w-type, which is a watch type. Uh, and here, when you add a watcher, and you also take a W type, which is a watch type. And you include that when you send it to the packetizer. We're basically just chaining this along, right? Um, and then add watcher is gonna push. And that is now going to be a uh, TX and a W type. Like so, watchers. So this is now a vec of, uh, where's this, of watch type. And now when we walk this, we can't actually remove. What we're going to want to do is, ah, what do I do? Ooh, watchers, watchers, watchers. Here, um, what we're going to want to do is get mute of this. Um, and then we're going to do something like watchers.retain. Uh, and we're only going to retain the ones we remove, so where the, where the watch type matches. Um, so retain is a method on a vec that um, iterates over all of them. And if you return true, then the element is kept in the vec. Otherwise, the element is removed. Actually, that's not going to work either, because retain does not get to own the thing. Uh, that's also a little awkward. Hmm. I think we're going to do something like we have to do for i in zero to watchers dot len. Uh, if i is greater than or equal watchers dot len, then break. You'll see why. It's, it's because we have to, so we're, we have to mutate the collection while we iterate over it. And retain is normally the way you'd want to do this. However, retain has the problem that it doesn't give you, you can't own the reference that it gives you easily. Um, which is a little sad. I sort of want something that's like retain that gives you a thing and you turn an option that thing, thing to decide whether or not it stays. But that's not currently what it does. Um, and so here, what we're going to do is we have to match on the, let's see, watchers i and um, watchers i dot one and the actual event we got. So that is a watched event, which is where, which is event type, e dot event type. All right, so we're gonna match on the, the pair of the event this watcher is waiting for, or the kind of, kind of watch this is, and the event uh, that we actually got to see whether the two match up. And then we're only going to remove the ones where it actually matches. All right, so here, let's say that we get watch type so if we have watch up child and any just write these out watch type data exists it seems like it's missing one oh i see yeah so ah right so this is it's a get children watch which should only be triggered on deleted or on child. 
So this should be on watched event type delete. Uh, node deleted. Uh, or on what's the other one that get children can trigger on uh, child event. Now I'm gonna have to pull up this. Where's watched event type? Uh, no children changed. So no children changed. Either of those will trigger. So that would be true. Uh, any other thing with child will not trigger. Uh, if it is an exists, then a watched event type children changed, it's going to not trigger, and any other type will trigger. And for data, it is deleted and changed are the only two. So for data, deleted and no ch uh, no data changed, these will return true, and anything else with data is going to be false. Right, so now we have the exact cases for when, uh, for which type of events trigger which kind of watchers. Um, and then if triggers, then we send, then I guess we're going to do something like so we need to, the, the problem is in order to send, we need to own the sender, which means we need to remove it from watchers. Uh, so swap remove uh, the current one. So swap remove is take this thing and swap it with the last thing in watchers and then remove the last thing. The reason you want to do that is if you try to remove something in the middle of the vector, you have to shift all the things that come after it down and that's pretty inefficient. Whereas swap remove just gets rid of that problem. Uh, so that gives us the W and uh, this watcher is no longer active. Uh, ooh, active. And then we send, otherwise, well, otherwise we don't really do anything. Like it stays in watchers. And so the idea here is that we're gonna keep walking until we get to the end of the array uh, or the end of the list of watchers. Uh, the reason we need this condition is because this range, when we initially compute watchers, actually we just do while, um, make sure we don't walk past the end given swap remove, right? So th initially this range is gonna be, uh, actually we could just do this, might as well. Uh, if we just had this be zero to watchers.len and didn't have this condition, then it would compute watchers.len as the beginning of the loop, right? But then as we swap remove, we're shortening the vector. So it's now looping to, let's say that the vector starts out being this long, um, and so that's what the range is set to. And then as we move through it, we remove a bunch of stuff from the end. So we're walking this, and like the vector is only this long. So we walk to here, which is all fine, but then we start walking this space because initially it was this long but here all those items have been removed and the program would crash um, so that's why we have to recheck the length on every every iteration uh, i did not like that watched event type so i guess this would be watched event type and complaining about something else too but i don't know exactly oh this um, and now, of course, if watchers dot is empty, then we want to remove it, uh, which there isn't really a nice way to do. Um, it might also require NLL, which is a little sad. So down here, we're going to do something like if you remove is false. So the, the only, we sort of want to remove, if there are no watchers left for a given path, then we want to remove that entry from the map. 
just so we don't take take up that additional space. Uh, then true, then uh, remove is true, and then down here, if remove, then self watcher is remove. We don't have, uh, and we don't care about whether it got removed. Well, it should always get removed. Um, try to remove watcher that didn't exist. Can't swap remove causes to skip a watcher because we never look at the watcher that was last. Um, no, that shouldn't be a problem because remember we keep iterating until we're past the end of the vector. So if something gets... Oh, you're right. We need to recheck the current index. Ooh, yeah, you're right. You're totally right. In fact, uh, you're totally right. I think this has to be watchers.len to zero. I don't know if I'm allowed to make a range that way. Let's do this the old fashioned way. While I is uh, uh, as I size, while I is less, is greater than or equal to zero, then do this. Yeah. I minus equals one. No, you're totally right. That's a good catch. Um, I think this should be right then. So we start at the end and we walk backwards through the array. It might be flipped for you, I'm not sure. So we walk backwards through the array um, and swap things to the end to remove them. So then the thing that we swap into the current location, we have already processed because it was at the end. And so therefore it's correct to continue moving back. Yeah, I think you're right. Uh, variant not found. Really? Oh, is it just exist instead of exists? Yeah. And this it's complaining because as you size as you size no matching send uh, dot zero because there we don't care about the type. Great. Let's see what that. Ooh, hello. Oh, watch type should be debug. Why is this not? This should be clone, copy, debug, eek, partial eek, and hash. Oh, hey, you're back. Um, 534. What's in that? 534. W type. Right, we need to extract that from the struct up here. Cannot find watch type. Right, so this has to use ZK error and watch type. So that we even have it in scope. Uh, 201. Right, and these now have to say what type of operation they are. Specifically, it's a watch type exists uh, this is a watch type child and this is a watch type data who oh failed that's uh failed to enqueue new request cancelled Ooh. Panicked. The length is one, but the index is one. That sounds like the while loop is not actually correct. Uh, 373. What? Oh, this file, 373. Yep. Uh, that is correct. This has to be 
minus one. Let's try that instead. Oh, it's still crashed. Because it expected, ooh. The test failed. Oh, because it's because we ran it previously. This is one of the annoyances of, of testing things that are persistent because our test failed halfway through, so it, cr it created the node. And so now when we run the test again, the test assumes that the node does not exist at the beginning. Uh, so we just need to delete slash foo. Let's try that. Great. Fantastic. All right, so now, um, just one thing that we might want to do, it probably doesn't really matter, but the um, we could make the path, the, the watchers list to be a try so that it's a prefix tree instead of a hash map. If you have a lot of paths that are similar, this might save you a bunch of storage. I don't think it's terribly important for this. Uh, so we're gonna do, that all seems fine. Uh, add custom watchers. Good job, team. We have custom watchers. Uh, I'll push in case people want to see the... Wait, why do I have a file here? Oh, right. I tried to write a Travis file. It's a little bit annoying. It turns out Running Zookeeper on Travis is not trivial. Um, okay, so the question is, where? what do we want to tackle next? Um, I think we want to add some documentation to this because it's getting pretty large. Um, luckily, we have the advantage that uh, there's a bunch of documentation that's been written for the Java version, and most of that should just straightforward apply to our implementation as well. So let us start by adding uh, deny missing docs. Uh, we also want to deny uh, missing debug info and missing clone info. Hmm. Inner attribute is not permitted following an outer attribute. These are all outer attributes. Oh, unknown lint. Uh, Rust missing info. What's it called? Missing debug info. It's whatever this thing is. Uh, Yeah, but what is the actual? Oh, it really is this. Okay. I think there's one for clone too, or maybe it's copy, actually. Inner. Oh, right. These all need to come first. Great. All right. Um, so the top level crate docs, I don't want to write quite yet. The zookeeper crate docs, here we could use the new external docs feature uh, where you can include um, documentation from external documents into your documentation directly. It's pretty neat, it just landed. Uh, basically you can do, it's like doc include and then some path. And then it just, that becomes the doc string of this particular struct. I don't actually want to do that in this case because I think we don't want this verbatim. We want s at least some changes to it. Um, let's uh, format this a little. The, one of the advantages to doing this is of taking the documentation from a different library rather than, or from, in this case, the sort of uh, original library and then modifying it as opposed to just writing our own is that as we read it, if there's something there that we find that we've missed, um, we'll detect that. If we just write our own, we'll just document what our library does, which is not necessarily what the library should be doing. Uh, of the 
one zookeeper. Uh, I don't want to say any of this. Servers, Huh. Okay, let us uh, not use them quite that directly. Uh, a connection to Zookeeper. All interactions with Zookeeper are performed by calling the methods of a Zookeeper. And we sort of want to say, so remember how um, a while ago, we also derived clone for Zookeeper because you can have, you can totally have multiple Zookeeper instances, uh, or you could have multiple things that send to the packetizer. Um, and so we will sort of want to say that here by calling the methods of a Zookeeper instance. Um, all clones of the same Zookeeper instance use the same underlying or uh, use the same underlying connection. Isn't it fun? Also, in the in the Java one, they have to document that things are thread safe unless otherwise noted. In Rust, this is expressed in the type system. Uh, the client was on hard reset vertically. Up to close Zookeeper. Send the client for send heartbeats. Uh, timeout value. We don't currently let the user set the timeout value, so that's not terribly important. Uh, the zookeeper instance will then no longer be usable, and all uh, futures will uh, resolve with a protocol level error to make further the application must create a new zookeeper instance so this is totally true for us right like if the connection if the connection to the server goes away then the logic we wrote in part two ensures that we try to reconnect to the server um, if the session expires then if we look at proto mod Remember how we have this like uh, sort of nested structure now where the packetizer has a state that is either connected or reconnecting. Um, and so if we, where's the place where we try to connect? Down here somewhere. Uh, Yeah, so if we pull the underlying state, so this is trying to drive it forward, and we get an error, and we were connected, then we try to connect again, right? We send another connect request. And if we get an error while we're trying to reconnect, then we just fail. So here, I guess this is something that we, down here somewhere. Uh, Right, sorry, here. This bit. So if we get an error while we're in the connecting phase, like the reconnecting phase, then um, we currently just return that error and we give up. Now, technically, here, we should do things like, uh, if we get a session expiry error, then we should let everyone know. Or, or if we get a session expiry error, then we should, then we should return like we do now. But if we don't get a section expiry, if we just try to connect to a server again and it fails, we should probably just retry and try a different server. That's hopefully something we'll uh, get to today as well. Um, but for now, we just exit, which will cause the packetizer to exit, which will call all futures to resolve with an error, which is the same thing we're promising here. Um, we might want to leave a note here that we will not auto connect. Uh, Server, the client currently to fail, so in other words, it's not going to automatically try to connect. Uh, yep. Uh, and then here we sort of want to add a note that 
So this is saying the word try to auto connect, which is true. Um, if well, I guess what we could do here is add like a section on limitations up here. That might be a better way to go about it. Um, we want to say that, uh, at least for the time being, multi-server deployments are, or multi-server connections are not supported. Um, also, uh, errors during reconnects are uh, client does not recover from errors during reconnects, such as session expiry. Right, so that's totally something that we sort of would have to fix. It shouldn't be all that difficult, right? So it's basically in this code in, um, in the packetizer, where here you would have to check what kind of error you got. And if the error was a session expiry, then you indeed want to return the error. Um, if it was not a session expiry, then you just try to enter the connected state again, right? You just try to connect again. Um, you're gonna have to remember like the, the ZXID from last time and whatnot, but that's something that should be doable. Uh, Secure APIs are either asynchronous or synchronous. That is not true in our implementation. Uh, can leave watches. Other successful Secure API calls. Oh, actually, that's a good point. This is also something we don't handle. So this is one of the reasons why this exercise is useful. Um, if a Zookeeper API call fails, then the no watch should be added. Whereas currently for us, if it fails, that's not something we do anything about. Hmm. That's a little awkward. Basically, the watch is not actually added unless the call succeeds. Um, hmm. In fact, there's a race condition that we've introduced now. So we add the watch or the watcher I don't know why they refer to them as both watches and watchers. We add it the moment we send the request, whereas in reality, we should add it once the response comes back. Because you can imagine that we, that we send the request and add the watcher as we currently do. Some other call modifies the node. We trigger our watcher, even though, and then the response to the original request that would have added the watcher comes back. Uh, and now the watcher has been triggered, but the watcher should only be triggered after the response the client gets back. So I think here actually, we're definitely making a mistake. So let's uh, leave some space here and deal with that. Specifically, uh, the observation here is that huh. I think what this has to do is with Watcher, I think all of these have to return just an end watch. Yeah, I, I think um, the API will actually want is instead of this, just have them all return a with watcher. And I guess uh, it means the custom is not going to take a TX. Like so. Uh, custom is not going to take anything. And then what we'll do is we'll have this return a zookeeper and an impl. Well, we're not allowed to use nested impl futures. Uh, 
but this will be a one-shot receiver watched event. Uh, actually, it won't even be that. It'll be this. Right? So if it succeeded, if the operation succeeded, then you get back the thing that will tell you about the watch event. I think that's what it's going to have to be. Uh, this is going to make some other things a little bit more complicated, but uh, same thing here. That is going to be here. And similarly, uh, it's going to be a little bit annoying for the global watch. This API is not pretty. It's really not pretty. Uh, I'm going to have to find some way around that. Um, yeah, that's not great. Mm. Well, I don't know. I don't have a good sense for how to tidy up this. It basically means that we need to send the, the transmit end of the watcher along with the request to the packetizer. And then the packetizer, when it sees the response, it adds the watcher. So it needs to sort of buffer up all the watchers that it's going to add. Hmm. Oh, that's a little weird. Um. I guess this just means that we need, we're just gonna have in Q be the, uh, here's, yeah, okay. Here's how that's gonna end up being. So exists, it's gonna take a path, a string, right? A path is a string and a, I think we're gonna move the whole watcher business, uh, the whole watch settings. I'm gonna move that up to here. So a watch uh, actually we'll move it to proto, I think. Or yeah, to proto. Um where do we put it? Just up here somewhere. So watch is this still gonna be a one shot. Huh. A one shot sender of a uh, watched event. Like so. And then we're gonna have exist and get children and and get data events. Instead of including this watch U8, they're gonna include a uh, watch that's gonna be a where's this use going to be a watch. So let me say forget children. It's going to be the same for path. Uh, the forget data. The reason we want to include the watch with the request is because um, when we enqueue the request, that's when the packetizer needs to remember that when the response comes back, it has to install this watcher. Uh, doesn't implement debug. Uh, sure it does. Uh, now we don't need task anymore because all the things we send are just going to be requests. Yeah. Actually, this is not bad. This is not bad. This is going to simplify the code a little bit. So the enqueuer is still just going to take a request. It's going to give you a... Yeah, it's going to give you a response. Add watcher goes away. Uh, this now contains. So we bring enqueuer back to include just a request and a one shot uh, receiver. 
function of response. Is that what it used to have? What, are, what do we use to have in task? Result response and ZK error. Like so. Uh huh. And this is now just going to send the thing it used to send, which is just a tuple. This now receives the same thing it used to receive, which is just this tuple again here. So the plan now is that the packetizer, uh, it's still going to have this one shot sender and watch type. That's all fine. But it's also going to have something like a pending watchers which is gonna be a map from XID to um, to a watcher that it has yet to install. To watcher to add when okay, right? So the, the idea here is if an operation with that XID succeeded, then add this watcher. And so pending watcher is down here. And then down here, where do we have our XID is one. So that business is all still correct. The difference down here is if the XID is something else down here. Uh, Response parse here. Uh, if let some watcher is self pending watchers dot remove xid, right? So if there is a if we were if we're supposed to add a watcher when this request completes. Then we do that here, and that will be pretty straightforward. It'll just be watchers.insert. Uh, oh, we don't have a path. So pending watchers also needs to include the path because we need to insert it into, we need to record the path in watchers when we do eventually add it. Um, so then that will be actually. Yeah, w dot zero, insert w dot one, w dot two. It's not very nice code, but it'll do the trick. Right, so what we're doing is if we get something with this XID, then we extract this string, use that as the key in this map, and then we insert the latter two things. So these two, uh, these two. And we insert those into that vec. Uh, I guess this is going to be entry this dot or insert with vec new dot push that. And this is going to be default watchers, no pending watchers. And it's just going to dot insert. Oh, it doesn't know the XID yet. Um, doesn't need to. This is just going to be now we always get request response. And so we enqueue that with that XID. And then we're going to match on the request. Are we going to get to do that? Probably not. We're going to have to match on the item. And if the item is a request uh, get data, right? So get data does have a, a watch property. 
The watch is a watch custom. So then we need to add that depending and same for get children that has a custom and same for exists that has a custom, right? So th the, the observation now is we instead just look at the request and see whether that had a custom watcher. In that case, we will do a uh, we will have to do ap dot pending watchers dot insert uh, self dot xid which is the xid of the request and now oh, we're gonna have to steal the watcher aren't we uh, we need to own the watcher in order to stick it into here so we're gonna have to do a mem replace watch with a watch this has to be global the reason we have to so the reason we have to swap out the watch is we need to own it so that we can insert it into pending watchers um, and the reason it's okay to replace it with watch global is because from this point forward the only thing the watch field of the request is going to be used for is whether to send a zero or a one as the value for watch uh, and global would cause it to be set to one and none would cause it to be set to zero and we can't set it to custom because custom, well, we could have this contain an option but that's also a little weird. Uh, so we just set it to global which causes it to be set to one. I guess we could document that here. Set to global so that watch will be sent as one UA. Uh, so now we're gonna insert into that the I guess we're gonna need the path. So we're gonna path dot two string and w and the watch type uh, data. Whew. And then we'll have to do the same for the other two. This is also gonna be path. This is also gonna be path. Uh, Notice that these are all basically the same. The only difference is what they uh, what the watch type is. So here we could pull the same trick as we did in the other place where we in um, uh, request serialization, where we match on all of them first and then just do a second match for this. Maybe that is nicer. Sure, let's do that. So it's this or this. For this, and then W type is going to be match item request get data is going to give a uh, watch type of data uh, get children is going to give one of child and exist is going to give of exist. Anything else is unreachable. And then this will use W type. And then these can go away. Uh, anything else we don't deal with. Whew. All right, what is it complaining about? Uh, pattern does not mention the other fields. We don't care about the other fields. What else is it complaining about? Uh, Pattern does not mention fields path watch. Missing fields path watch. What? It's very confused. Why does it say that? 528. Am I not allowed to do this? I thought I was allowed to do this. Uh, like I want to bind to watch, but only if it's of this type. 
pretty sure I'm allowed to do that, but I guess I could just do this. And then if let watch type custom. Watch. Sure. Apparently that's okay. Don't know why it's why it's suddenly okay with it now. Uh, no variant custom found for. Oh, this was just watch, right? I'm complaining here. No, that's just old stuff. Uh, undeclared typer module watch settings, 224. Uh, lib 224? Right. Uh, register watcher is no longer necessary now. In fact, none of these are? Oh no, they are. Uh, this has to be a watch is the only thing that's important. So this will be self.zk and this will be watches self.watch. And then this just has to use this and watch. Right? So the only difference is that we're instead of just sending a zero or one for a watch, we're sending along the entire watch thing that we want. Uh, right. And then I guess we're gonna have to uh, txrx is we have to create the channel that will actually be used. Ooh. Hmm. It's actually a little awkward how that's gonna work. Well, let's leave that aside for now. Uh, Self.zk, this is just gonna self.watch. Uh, this is gonna be self.zk and self.watch. Ah. Receiver watch event. So we um, we need to when we create the end watch, in order to create a watch, we have to create the transmit end of a one shot. And so we'll create a re the receive end. Well, st we have to stick the receive end somewhere so that we only return it when the thing resolves, which would be down here. So this is where this is now in Rx. All right, I guess actually yeah, I could totally be down here. ZK. No, it does need to be here. We only want to give back the Rx here. And I guess technically this should be an option, but this API is really awkward, right? Because you only get back a receiver if you asked for a receiver. I worry that we're like abstracting too much over the over the fact that this, these may or may not be watched. Maybe the better API really is one where you, uh, you're only exposed to this if you, hmm. Uh, that's pretty awkward. So my worry here is that, well, actually, uh, this receiver will only be sent on if you used with the watcher. Because if you use watch, you also get an end watch, but then it will not be sent on because we'll be sending on the global watcher. Hmm. So 
So it's almost like we want this to be uh, like a watch globally struct that is really just an end watch, but we hide the we hide things from the return type. This would be a with watcher. And this would be a with watcher, I guess. So here we can just map out the watcher, right? So in all these methods, the user wouldn't see the, the sort of option receiver at all. With watcher. So this has an option Rx. So this means that the exist type in here oh, would have to be option. Yeah, I don't know how to, um, how to make this API nicer except by having lots of methods, right? You would totally imagine that you have like, uh, just like in the original API, you have a bool that's watch on all of them. And then you have a separate version of them that give you a watcher. Hmm. Well, it, it could be that we really just want to replicate these. Maybe they are different enough that... Here's what we can do. Uh, fix... Well, uh, map... Exists response. This is going to help a lot, actually. Don't know why I didn't think of this. So if we move this out, right, then now exists is really straightforward, right? Because this is just going to be uh, this method now, map exists response, right? So now it doesn't really hurt to replicate exists. And so now we could have a separate one for each of these. And then the return type is just not a problem, right? So now it'll be this and this will be watch none, right? Yeah, I think that's the way to go. Why is it? Right, so this will now just be self.connection. And then we'll do the same for all the others, right? So we'll have a map uh, get children response. There's an R response. Um, we have to set a return type, but I'll, I'll do that in a second. Um, Because now we can just use these and build on top of them, right? Uh, like so. And this will then be here. And then uh, map get children response. And then what's the last get data response? Yeah, this is going to be much nicer. Um, data response here. It's going to be this guy. Dog. Map get data response. So now the methods that we have that do not add any kind of watcher are just straightforward. Here, Let's see. Sorry, I'm just moving a bunch of code around. I'll, I'll, it should be clear once these are in place. Okay, so the things we're looking at now are the the three sort of watchable methods directly on Zookeeper. So this is without watching them at all, right? So in this case, watch should be uh, watch none for all of them, and the return type 
for all of them should be this. This doesn't have to be a future at all even, does it? No. I think this just returns one of these. A result of that. Well, sort of. That's actually a little awkward. I think I made that sillier than it needed to be. Uh, this for exists, it's really just a stat, right? I think that's the type exists has. It's an option stat, it's an option vec string, and that's an option vec stat. Okay, so this is an option vec string. So, great. Why is it saying that that's not okay? Uh, unexpected close delimiter, that is true. Now it's coming. Associated type bindings are not allowed here. That is true. It, in fact, has to do this. In fact, I'm, oh, that's the one place. Damn, that was unnecessary. Didn't copy it to the one place where the signature was actually correct. Here, it should be a vec u8 and a stat. Uh, these can actually be a, well, it's not terribly important. Um, all right, so these top methods now, why is it? Uh, this should be self. So the reason I wanted to move them like this, oh, what is this? Cannot fight type response. Uh, this should be proto response. Actually, this should be res result proto response. ZK error. I think that's the type of R. Like so. Yep. So for these, uh, these top methods, the implementation is now very straightforward. And then what we could do is, if then we don't need no watch anymore. Uh, there's now, with watch, this could really just return a watch globally that just wraps self and then just calls these methods again, right? So watch globally uh, is just a wrapper around self, just a new type around self uh, that has these exact same methods. So uh, pub struct watch globally just has a zookeeper inside. Intel inside. No. Right? And that implementation has the same methods. In fact, with the almost the exact same implementation. Ah, what did I do? Ah, that's not what I meant to do. Like this. Uh, the only difference is that instead of a watch none, it's a watch global. And instead of self, it will be self dot zero. I'll give you a zookeeper. Right? This is a really awkward way to work around adding a Boolean argument, but I think it results in code that's nicer to read. Um, right? Like if you think about it, all we're doing here, the only thing we're doing is to change the uh, effect. <laughs> we could do this even better. We could, here, uh, fine, 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 fine. Watch bool. If watch, then watch global, else watch none. Just to make us all a little bit happier. 
uh, it says w path false because now this implementation could be self dot zero dot exists w true even less duplication and then this would be get children w watch pool so notice that behind the scenes we sort of have the same api as the the synchronous crate really um, but we're just trying to expose it in a slightly nicer way it's using what are what essentially essentially amounts to um combinators um so there the w methods are not public the public methods all just take path uh, now get children w false and the one in here is going to be get hmm? children w true And the same for get data. It's going to be this. It's going to use this, just like the other one. And it's going to be a one without a W down here. Ooh, in fact, we can actually make this even better. So I'm going to do that in a second, but. Uh, like so this is self get data w so it's the exact same pattern for all of them and down here this is just going to be get data w true so the question of course now is how do we get the actual oh, why does it this question takes two parameters oh right uh, path path um, the question is how we add the ones that have custom watchers and we can do that a little bit nicer by path. Um, by instead of it having it take a bool having it take an option actually having it take a watch I guess is really what it should do so this takes a watch and then just uses that directly here. And then this would just pass in watch none. This takes a watch and just puts that in here. Calls it with watch none. And similarly, this takes a watch. Do, 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 do. It takes a watch. And this is a watch none, right? So we now have this sort of helper building on helper building on helper. I guess in theory, uh, we don't we didn't need to extract the maps anymore with this pattern. Don't know why I didn't think of this before. So this just returns a with watcher. So. Right. So a watch globally is pretty straightforward. And in fact, a with watcher is almost as straightforward. The only difference in the with watcher is that it also includes the one shot receiver, right? For the watched event. That is the only difference. And these are now tuples. Right, so if the operation succeeded, then you get both back something you can wait on for the result, and you get back the uh, the actual result of the operation you did. And now these, oh right, these all have to be watch global. These all have to be, they have to make a one shot, right? Uh, nope, one shot channel. And then they do something like watch custom TX. 
and then we're gonna have to here dot uh, map r and we're gonna actually let's do the mute r no r match r if r is okay yeah so r here is basically a result where this is the okay value and this is the error Actually, no, uh, R here is just that tuple, right? So map is only called on the okay of the future, which in this case is this from the underlying um, exist W, right? The item is this, which so we're mapping on one of those. So I think what we want to do is let ZK is R dot zero and then let uh, V so the value is going to be r.1 if it is none well i guess it's just going to be r1.map that's going to be a stat and we're going to make that be move uh, rx and stat and then we're going to return fact becomes even more straightforward. It's just this. I don't know if that makes sense, but we're calling the underlying exist W, right? Which just, is, just takes any watch, it doesn't really care. And then on the result that we get back, we map the option that normally just contains a stat when you call exist W and we put in the RX when it succeeded. If it did not exceed, it just gets dropped, in which case the, the, we never give out the receiver either, so it's not really a problem. Right, so here we, whenever you want to execute something with a watcher, we create the one shot channel, we send the transmitter down the pipe as a request. When the response comes in, uh, the response will be generated here. If the response is an OK, which we know because map only is triggers on OK, and the option is sum, which we know by this map, then we give out the Rx. Otherwise, we don't give out the Rx and it's just dropped and nothing happens. Nice. So the same pattern we can basically use for all of these, I think. So this is just going to be this instead. Um, and this is going to be a little bit different just because it's already a tuple. So this will be bytes and stat, and we're going to make that just a, a three tuple instead of a nested tuple. Like so. I guess instead of S, we should call this C for children. It's not terribly important. And now all the stuff down here can all go away. And now, of course, the API here changed a little in that the API is this dot with watcher dot exists. Then this is going to give us a Yeah, this is where it's going to be a little bit annoying. Right, because here we're going to get the Rx back here. And we're going to... We sort of want to eventually receive on this Rx, right? Do How do we pass the Rx forward? Specifically, we need the... Uh, Oh, this is the watcher, right? We need the watcher to be passed forward to he down here. Well, sorry, to down here. So this is now what used to be exists W. Um, of course, the way to do that is we inspect. And then here, we actually have to, this is where it gets annoying, where we have to map it forward. Um, dot map 
x, I guess, move, x, exists w. I guess we could be a little bit nicer here and uh, do this so that this becomes a little bit less annoying. Right, so notice we're just like, this is what we've done this a bunch before with futures too. We sort of end up having to chain values along the futures because we get the exists w like all the way up here. And then we need to access it all the way down here. And so we need to make sure that all of the futures to resolve in between carry that value along. Um, so here we get it in and then we have to make sure that we pass it along down here. Uh, exist W. This ignores it. This is exist W and uses the exist W. Let's see what, ooh, that's a lot of, a lot of errors there. Uh, proto mod five four seven. Um, right, these have a bunch of fields that we do not care about. Um, watch is private on twenty nine. Uh, is it really? Did I make it private? No. It does have to be pub crate. Watch type also only has to be pub crate. Uh, 29. Don't need watch type. That is true. 69. Expected receiver found sender. Oh, right. This should be a sender. And similarly, I guess this should be a sender. All right, we're getting there slowly but surely. 425, remove XID has to be a ref. 549, ambiguous associated type. That is the weirdest error I've seen for that before. Expected sender found watch. Oh, right. Uh, yeah, it's a little awkward. W. We need to extract the actual watcher. So this will be a watch, right? It won't be the the inner thing of a watch custom. So we need to extract that out. And we know that we can't possibly get here because we just observed that it was watch. Uh, quest 137. Right. And this now has to be... Uh, 2u8 and where else? Right, so the now that we have this watch type, when we serialize that onto the wire, uh, the watch of fn, well, I guess, great, 2u8. Then all we really want is we want to write out a one if we want the thing to be watched and zero if it does not, which is pretty straightforward. It's just if let uh, watch none itself, then it's a zero. And in every other case, it's one. This returns a U8. Request 132. Right, this now has to be a watch, a ref. It used to be a copy type, right? It used to be a U8. Uh, 540. K 
cannot borrow field of immutable binding as mutable. Uh, and now we're back to missing documentation, which will just... So this is how much work can end up being by just following the documentation of the official implementation, just to check that your implementation actually matches. Because that's what we were doing when this started. All right, let's see. Uh, 359, this should just be Zookeeper. Expected option. Oh. Hmm, that's a good point. So for exists, um, you actually get the watcher even if the operation did not succeed. This is not true for get children or for, or for get data because the only way they can fail is um, if the node does not exist. But for exists, um, the watcher is still added because you can learn that the node was added. I don't think this is true for get data. It's a very good question. Let's see what the Java docs say. So for get children with a watcher and the call is successful. No exception is thrown. And an exception is thrown if the no node exists. Is this not true for exists then? Yeah, so exists does not throw an exception, it just returns null, so therefore the watcher is added. What about get data? Uh, get data throws an exception if it does not exist okay so it's it's only for exists that this is the case specifically for with watcher on exists the one shot receiver is outside of the option is all this means that here you always get the rx if the operation succeeded Sorry, even if the operation failed. There's a protocol error, you obviously don't get one. Let's see how that turns out. 361. Right, so now you always get that, and this is not a nested tuple. No? Uh, that's not great. Well, that's not great. So that sounds like we didn't get a notification somewhere. Uh, so let's see. Not request exists. So where is this even? node created so it's handling the response to node created and at that point that's where we block for exist w so this suggests that the uh the dispatcher never actually sends out the signal here so something is definitely wrong right so it does get the watcher right it gets both the custom watcher up here and the global watcher down here, then it gets the event down here, but it never sends to the custom watcher. So the question is why? Huh. So let's see, in the packetizer exists, So I guess this is here. Uh, 
adding pending watcher for xid this uh, on this path for and then the w type and I guess pending watchers, we want to see whenever that gets triggered uh, for xid this turned into real watcher. I guess this is xid. Well, let's just see what that gives us. Oh, we're going to have to delete the node again. Delete foo. Uh, let's see what happens. So here, let's see. Added. So it did add it for xid one on slash foo for exists. Handling response to xid one with opcode exists. This doesn't seem like it's, it doesn't do anything in, in return to this. So that's probably our problem. So for whatever reason, this doesn't trigger. Because uh, it prints this, right? It, it prints that the it prints that it got the response to XID one. And we know that, oh, it does produce an error. Huh? Yeah, that's why, but that's still a little awkward, right? So this means that we sort of end up installing this thing yeah. I guess this is like if uh, error dot is none it, it's sort of a special case right so normally if an operation fails we don't want to to turn the pending watcher into a real watcher the exception to this is if the is if the operation was an exists and the result was no node. That's pretty awkward. I wonder what other are there other errors that we can get for an exists call? Uh, map exists response. Where is it? So map exists response only handles the case of no node, right? Hmm. It's like either there's an error, either there is no error, or the op code. Hmm. I don't actually know what the nicest way to do this is. It's like I sort of want to do like if the opcode is equal to opcode exists and the error is equal to zk error no node. Right? Like that is the only case in which you want to add the watcher. Normally, watchers are, or I guess watches, are only added for successful operations. The exception to this is if an exists call fails with no node. But it's telling me that I can't 
compare ZK errors. That is definitely true. Because here, eek and partial eek, please. And now that should be okay. Opcode, right, really? Do I not have opcode here? Oh, it's uh, request opcode. And we need to delete foo again because the test failed halfway through. All right, great. Now we're back. We are back. Let's just see that the progression here works the way we expected. So it creates the session, so that's all fine. It adds a pending watcher, right? And then when it gets the response, it turns it into a real watcher, even though the exist call failed. Uh, here it gets a watcher that's global, but it does not add a pending watcher, nor does it add a normal watcher. Um, and then when it gets this foo, it just notifies the global watcher, which is still what we expect it to do. Nice, I think we're all good. So let's see. And then we add, actually, I do want to get rid of these uh, these map things because they're no longer needed. So map exists response, where is that? Up here, it's gonna R. So that goes away, map get children response goes away. Uh, and this goes away. Uh, with first trying to add a watcher from the pending ones, you do not leak the watchers for the unsuccessful requests. Uh, let me see if I parse that correctly. With first trying to add a watcher from the pending ones. Yeah. You do not leak the watches for the unsuccessful requests. Well, so it, get, it gets removed from pending watchers right and then um if this condition if these conditions are not true it doesn't get inserted into watchers and therefore it will be dropped which is the correct thing to do right because in this case it should never be used by any of the consumers anyway like the rx should also be dropped in this case so i'm not entirely sure what you think is wrong with this um i i think this is right but I've been wrong in the past. You first remove it from the pending ones on a successful request. Yes? It always gets removed. So remember, it, the pending watchers are tied to an XID, right? Which there will only be one of. We should only get one response from an HXID. So I think this should be right. Um, all right, so let's commit this before we continue our crazy path of docs. Um, here, let's see, sure, why not, oh, that's a formatting change, oh well, that's all fine, and we want this to be um, only register watches once request has succeeded. Right, back to the docs. Now that this statement is true again, uh, some successful Zookeeper API calls can leave watches on the data nodes in the Zookeeper server. 
Other calls can trigger those watches. Once the watch is triggered. Yep. Uh, Sorry for the interruption. Oh, I see. You just wanted to point out that... No, no, that's fine. So you pointed out that in the... The code is better now because in the past it would leak watchers. Yeah, that's true. The other reason why it's better now is because it also doesn't have to create uh, uh, one-shot channels that will never be used. The old code sort of had to create them regardless because of the abstraction that is now gone. So I, I agree with you. I think this is much better. Um, okay, so this is slightly different for us. We don't actually send that. Uh, so this is something that we'll want to add, but don't currently have. I also want to add some examples here. Uh, It seems a little bit weird for some of this documentation to be on Zookeeper. Uh, yeah, I think some of this I want to be top level documentation. In fact, probably what we want is something like this, right? The, the Zookeeper programmer's guide is sort of like, this is the kind of stuff that, or even the, um, where is the getting started guide or the overview, right? It's almost like, well, this stuff is almost like what I want to... Well, not bookkeeper. What is bookkeeper? Overview. This overview. Right? It's like these kind of things I want to be in the in the docs. But I think, like, I will probably do some tidying up of this after I finish the stream because moving text around is not particularly interesting to watch. It's more that I want us to add it and do a parsing of the text to see whether there are things that we haven't implemented, right? Which we've already found one, right? Um, all right, so back to this. So, I guess, well, I guess this connect, which would be what, new in Java? I don't know if there's a documentation for the constructor. Sure. Let's see whether any of this is true for us. Yeah, so we, we certainly don't have ch root yet. Um, which we'll want. This is similar to what the, the synchronous um, Rust Zookeeper implementation has, where like it will if you add this this ch root argument, then any path you get back will have that prefix removed for you, so you don't need to deal with it. It's a very convenient feature that we just haven't implemented because it's not particularly interesting. Uh, but definitely something that we would want to add going forward. Um, and also, of course, currently we only support a single server. To create a Zookeeper instance, Connect to a Zookeeper server instance at the given address. Yep. Uh, I guess here we don't actually take a watcher argument, right? We just return uh, Z uh, when the connection when the session is established a zookeeper instance is returned along with a watcher that will provide 
uh, notifications of any changes in client state. Well, I guess it really is state because it's server state as well. Uh, this notification. No, it's not important for us. Uh, Right, so this is a part of that that we don't yet have, that we may get time to do in the stream. It's a little unclear, given that we ended up in the, the rat hole of, uh, of watchers. We'll see. Uh, if the connection to the server fails, uh, the client will automatically try to reconnect. If reconnection fails, so this is the code we wrote last time. Um, so only if reconnection fails is an error returned to the client. Uh, requests that are in flight during a disconnect may fail and have to be retried. Handshake is private, so that's fine. All right, let's look at create. Uh, I guess this one. The asynchronous version of create. Great, thanks. Good docs. Uh, create a node with a given path. The node data will be the given data and node ACL will be the given ACL. That seems unhelpful. Uh, as its contents. Let's not be overly verbose in docs. Uh, the flags argument, do we have a flags argument? No. The mode argument specifies whether the node will be created as ephemeral or not. specifies additional options for the newly created mode. If mode is set to ephemeral, what do we call this uh, mode? Do we remember? Oh, we also we need to do a bunch of work on this ACL stuff. We currently just copied that straight out of Zookeeper. And I think this can also be tidied up a lot. In particular, these lazy statics things should just not be necessary. Um, so let's see, create mode. If mode is set to ephemeral, uh, or I guess here, it also applies if they're ephemeral sequential. Uh, the node will be removed by Zuki automatically when the session is associated with the creation of the node expires. Uh, if mode is set to persistent sequential or ephemeral sequential, The actual path, given path plus a suffix i, where i is the current sequential number of the node. The sequence number is always fixed length of 10 digits. That's not controlled by us, so that's fine. So now this is going to be recommended by one. The, uh, I guess we'll document elsewhere that the final, the returned, uh, the newly created node's full name is returned uh, when the future result. When the future is result. What else do we have? If a node with the same actual path already exists in Zookeeper, uh, then 
error create node exists is returned. If a node with the same actual path already exists in Zookeeper, this is returned. No exceptions in Rust, so that's nice. Uh, note that since a different actual path, this is a different actual path is used for each invocation of creating sequential nodes with the same path argument. Uh, calls uh, with sequential modes will never return node exists. Uh, if you return async not ready once, does your future not get pulled anymore? Um, so not ready does not actually impact whether you get pulled again. In general, not ready just tells, all it does is tell the, um, the thing that runs the future that the future is not yet ready. It does not say like when to wake up that future again or when to pull it again. In fact, normally it will never be pulled again until something notifies that future. And so this is why you need to make sure that if you have a future, you pull all the underlying futures um, so that eventually they will like pull a network socket or something that that Zookeeper, or sorry, not Zookeeper, that Tokyo or whatever drives your futures knows to wake things up again. So for example, if you had, um, if you had implemented a future that just like, all it did was return, uh, immediately return async ready, it will be called once and never again. You need something to, so this is what notifications are for, to notify that something has to be woken up again. Uh, Error create, uh, what's the other? No node. Uh, is returned. Or I guess it's weird to say is returned for futures, right? Uh, the return future resolves with an error of, yeah, that's better. Uh, if the parent does this, the return future resolves to an error. I guess this really. Um, since ephemeral nodes cannot have children, uh, or if the parent node of the given path is ephemeral, uh, or I guess ephemeral nodes cannot have children in Zookeeper. Therefore, uh, if the parent node is ephemeral, the returned future resolves to, uh, in that case, it will be error create. This is the one that has the funky name. No children for ephemerals. Do all watches left on the node of the given path by exists and get data API calls, and which is the parent node by get children API calls. If a node is created successfully, the secret server will trigger watches on the path. Wait, isn't this saying the same thing? This operation, if successful, will trigger all the watches left on the node of the given pathway exists and get data API calls. I don't think that's true. I don't think get data will be triggered. Wasn't this what we looked at? So, or semantics of watches. Yeah, created should not 
trigger get data. I think that's false. If a notice created successfully, the secret server will trigger the watches on the path left by exist calls. And the watches on the parent of the node by get children calls. Wait, so that this documentation is just wrong. These two sentences are contradictory. And I think only the second one is true. So uh, Oh. Arrays larger than this will cause a keeper exception to be thrown. Is this an error that we don't handle? Like, is there a too large thing here? I think we looked at this last time. Doesn't look like it. Maybe like a bad arguments or something. Let's just leave it like that for now. It's a little underspecified, but we'll live. All right, so it looks like we have create working correctly. Um, so let's look at delete. <clears throat> uh, where's delete? Delete. Async version. Thanks. How do we feel about this one? Delete the node with the given path. The call will succeed if such a node exists and the given version matches the node's version. If the given version is minus one, it matches any node's versions. Uh, I don't think we actually need to include any of that information because that's already documented on our error struct, right? So I think that's still fine. Uh, like this is not, because this is not Java, right? Like it's not like, you might randomly get exceptions thrown. So I think we can remove that too. I think that's good. Uh, this operation is successful. We'll trigger all watches on the node of the given path left by exists API calls and the watches on the parent node left by get children calls. That also seems correct. Great. Uh, these we're going to have to do a little bit later um, because they're a little bit special. But exists, we might as well write now. So exists, and this is exists without a watcher. So it's this one. Thanks. Does this have a special docs? Yeah, probably. All right. So this one. Uh, return the stat you know, of the given path. There's a space in the first sentence of the delete method. Did I? Uh, you missed a space. Ah, good catch. Thanks. I think the deletes version could be none instead of minus one. Oh, yeah, no, you're totally right. If the given version is none matches any node versions. It is sort of true that like, you could also give some minus one. It's just that none is the right. You're totally right. Uh, return the stat if you give node path. If it exists. Well. And I guess here, what we'll really do is we'll take the same docs and put them on watch globally for exists. Um, if no errors occur, a watch will be left. The watch will be triggered by a successful operation that creates or deletes the node or set that creates or deletes the node 
comma or sets the data on the node. Wait, really? Changing the data triggers and exists? That's really weird. I don't know why that would be the case. Oh, I guess it changes the stat is what they're thinking. Uh, great. So that means that here it is really just uh, or none if the node does not exist, which I guess we probably want down here too. If no errors occur. All right, uh, get children. I guess we might as well add the this one as well. Actually, I guess realistically, uh, the watch will be triggered by this one, and a notification will be sent to the uh, default to the watch to the global watcher, and then here the documentation for exists with watcher is going to be and a notification and the included one shot receiver will be notified great all right so get children get children on up here. Turn the list of the children of the node of the given. This is terrible English. Turn the list, return. The names of the children of the node with the given path better. Uh, watch can't be true. The return, the returned list of children is not sorted. Uh, or none if the node does not exist. I guess this we're going to put down on here too. And then we're going to remove the stuff about watches down there. Uh, this is now if no errors occur. Why, why is this all passive voice? Uh, a watch is left on the node and is triggered by a successful operation that deletes the n n node with the given path or comma or creates or deletes a child of that node. Uh, I guess the watch is triggered uh, and well the phrasing here is a little bit there are more paths that miss the ticks See, probably. Uh, really? Oh, down here, probably, yeah. Um, well, I'm still trying to find the right way to phrase this. Let's look at exist first. If no errors occur, a watch is left on the node with a given path. Uh, path. The watch is triggered by a successful operation that creates or deletes the node 
or sets the data or sets the nodes data triggered by any successful operation that creates or sets the nodes data. Uh, when the watch triggers, an event is sent to the global watcher. Watcher stream. Right. Well, the watch is triggered by when the watch triggers an event to send to the global watcher stream. Great. And then of course the same will be for get children. And this should now be the watch is triggered by any successful operation. I really think that should be any. By any. Any. The watch is triggered by any successful and causes the included watch to resolve. Okay, so here's the watch. The watch triggered by. So it's the same thing. Any successful operation. And in turn causes the included one shot receiver to resolve. Okay, I think that's decently clear. All right, what else do we have? Get data. Get data. This one. Return the data and the stat of the node at the given path. With the node. Great. At. 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 Great. Much better. Um, where were we? Get data. And this and that. Great. Uh, there are no watches here. So this is just or none if it does not exist. Yes. Let's do this. And then this gets moved down to get data. Uh, and then this phrasing is basically the same. If no errors occur, a, a watch is left on the node at the given path. Uh, the watch is triggered by any successful operation that sets data on the node, that sets the node's data or deletes it. And then we add this bit. When the watch triggers, an event is sent to the global watcher stream. And that error goes away. And then get data down here, it gets the same docs, except that it does not trigger on the global stream. It instead does this. Fantastic. All right. Uh, what have we missed? Probably a bunch of things. This is uh, 
per operation zookeeper error types. Oh, it's really... Reads good so far. Okay, that's great. I think it's certainly better than the Java version. We'll see whether it actually ends up being good. Uh, error. Uh, an error that occurs. Uh, I want to phrase this as it's an error that occurs because of the request and not because of like the protocol or the server. Uh, uh, A reason, uh, it's like reasons, ugh, I don't want to call it reasons either. It's like, uh, errors that may cause a delete oper the delete request to fail. Oh, do I need to document all the variants? No. Oh. The target, the target node does not exist. Exist. Uh, the target node has a different version than was specified by the call to delete. Uh, yes. Let's split these up a little. Uh, the target node has child nodes and therefore cannot be deleted. I also want some of these to have links to the Java docs or to the Zookeeper web docs. Um, but that seems like something that's slightly less important. Uh, the target node already exists. I guess a node with the given path already exists. Uh, no node exists with the given path. Then target, uh, target node is fine. Uh, uh, the parent node, well, I don't even want to phrase this. I guess this is uh, the parent node of the given path does not exist. Uh, the parent node of the given path is ephemeral and cannot have children. given ACL is invalid. It's so unfortunate that invalid ACL does not give you further information. It seems like a, seems like a mistake. Oh, I guess these should derive, well, certainly debug, and I guess in theory clone, although I guess there's no reason not to have it derive clone. It's just a little weird to, clone it, but zookeeper cannot, oh, you can't debug zookeeper? Let's see, oh. Uh, um, proto error, that should definitely derive both copy and clone. Arguably also like hash, ord, partial ord. Oh, we're getting pretty close. Uh, oh no, error bad version. Really, I need to document every field. Uh, the, ex the expected node version. Minus one indicates, I guess here, it basically has to not be minus one because you could never get this error if you expected version minus one because it matches any version. So there's no reason to 
include it there. Um, we also need to document this. Um, uh, so I guess this is a proxy for operations that Well, this is a proxy for zookeeper. Uh, that adds watches for any uh, triggered operations for any for initiated operations. Uh, triggered watches uh, produce events on the global event, global watcher stream. And then I guess for with the watcher that adds watches that adds non-global watches produce events on uh, triggered watches or I guess events from triggered watches uh, are yielded through returned one-shot channels all events are also produced on the global watcher stream. All right, what's left? Well, we're almost there. FN watch. So this is uh, perform the following operation. Uh, I guess the next chained operation uh, or add a watch on the node targeted on add a watch for the next chained operation and let's just call it a global watch and I guess we could say C uh, it's not even necessary add a watcher I have to watch for the next chained operation and return a future for any received event uh, along with the operations result. Successful. Wow, successful result. Whew. All right, so now we have docs. Add lots of docs. We don't really have uh, top level docs yet though. Let's just do this for now. We'll obviously want it to be much more expensive. There are probably still some things we want to tidy up. I don't think I want to start multi-server connections in part because I don't have a good way to test it. CHroot would be a great thing for someone to add. Um, I don't think it's particularly interesting to watch me implement it because it's mostly just like cutting strings in various places. Um, let's see, what else do we have here? I guess we could add all these to-dos up as limitations. It'd be like the right thing to do. Or we could add them as issues, really. As a better thing to do. So actually, let's do that while we're here. Issues. Uh, new issue. Uh, give. Uh, send connection events on global watcher stream. 
from Java docs. I guess I want these. It's a nice way to just like track things that still need to be done. Uh, so there's that. There is seven. Um, support uh, connecting to multiple. Well, support pools of zookeeper servers. More than one other. Yeah, we also don't currently distinguish between um, an expired session and just an error during your connection. And technically, those are very different in the Zookeeper world. Um, along those lines, also handle uh, session expiry differently from errors during reconnect. Uh, what else we have? Right. Support ch root. Yes, we can call it a feature. I guess I should tag these too. These are great if you just want to like start playing around with the code. Uh, from Java Docs. Note that this uh, needs to affect all paths in the code base, um, including uh, watched events. Excluding fields in watched event. Uh, so, we probably have other to do's too. Let's see, what do we have? To do, test this. Nice. Yeah, that's true. We don't really have tests for connection failure, in part because they're a little tricky to do. I think we basically have to mock the network, which is totally something we could do. It's just a little bit annoying to get set up. Uh, I don't think realistically that's going to change anymore. Uh, yeah. That is true, actually. This is something that we don't say. Um, specifically, we sort of need to say here somewhere that all of these future require you to run them on a Tokyo runtime. Because we use things like timers, right? So you can't just like call dot wait on this and expect it to work. Uh, so I think we'll do that up here. Note that all operations, that all future, uh, the futures in this crate expect to be running under a Tokyo runtime. In the common case, you cannot simply uh, resolve, you cannot resolve them solely using dot wait. Because dot wait wouldn't run a runtime. Uh, what else do we have? Okay, so this has now been done. Uh, connect here direct. Oh, that's right. So now when we added the zookeeper transport trait in the previous stream, we now have this weird setup, right? Where connect. Um, only call calls like TCP stream connect directly, 
and then does the handshake. But now we can just do that directly in Packetizer new because Zookeeper Transport has this connect method directly. Um, and it's sort of unfortunate for this to be tied up in the, in the outer connect because it means that this outer connect can't be generic, right? We sort of want this to be generic over S. Um, where this is like s adder, and I guess s would be zookeeper transport adder or something. I don't remember exactly what it was. Uh, did I? I committed this already, right? Yeah. Um, I mean, we could try that. Um, so in theory, that just takes any adder. I don't think we actually want to do this right now. But yeah, I think I think this is definitely an addition that we want to add. So, new issue. Um, support non TCP connections and handshakes. Because Packetizer is fully generic over the underlying transport. But Zookeeper is not. Um, but it only only really requires that for connect. Uh, so we should uh, we should use the zookeeper transport trait to bring all the network connectivity stuff uh, things uh, into packetizer new including the handshake uh, because the handshake can be uh, then be reused uh, for session reestablishment. So if you recall from the last stream uh, establishment, if you recall from the last stream uh, in the session reestablishment stuff, we have to create a new one of these like request connect objects, which is basically what handshake does already. And it's sort of unfortunate for this to be happening in two places. And so that's also something that should be, uh, would be nice to fix up. Um, what else do we have that's a to-do? I think this one can go away. Uh, that one can go away because we now have an issue for it. Uh, that error, I don't know if we even need. Oh, maybe we should do logging. How do we feel about logging? Do we want to do like a... Just like do a pass and get rid of all the print lines and debug stuff and add proper logging throughout the thing. Would that be interesting to watch? I mean, if, if you think so, write it in the chat. Um, just finishing the pass through for to-dos. Um, or if there's something else you want to see, then uh, now's the time to shout out. Move to do's to GitHub issues. Oops. Yeah, do it. All right, then let's do it. Um, let's see. So I, let's get rid of some of these. I guess we do want to add links to some of these later. Just. It's not terribly important for now. I'll probably do a pass on the documentation after I finish the stream because we've now done the important thing, which is walk through and see that we actually conform to what the Java client says that we should do. Um, but there's a bunch of other tidying up that we can do. And you can watch the commits on the repo if you want. Um, if you want to see what things I end up doing later. Not sure whether I get to it today, but we'll see. Um, so for logging, there are a bunch of Rust logging libraries. One that I like really... Uh, quite a lot is uh, slog. I don't know how you pronounce that. S-log, slog, slog sounds good. Uh, because it has multiple logging levels, which log also does, uh, but it also has, a, um, it's customizable in terms of the output format. Uh, so you can have, uh, like a, there's like a colored terminal logger, for example, that's really handy. So let's do that. Uh, slog is like 
one point something, two point something, two point three. Point two. Oh, no. Uh external crates log. And ooh. Uh what we want, that's a good question. So the, the basic setup of slog is you have what's known as a drain or a logger. Um, and if you look at the logger, bah, 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 where's logger? Logger. Um, so a logger, like you can create new loggers pretty easily. Um, but the crucial thing that you want is there's a bunch of, bunch of macros that are basically up here, like crit, debug, error, info, and log that are the different logging levels. Um, and if you have a logger, you can always create a new nested logger with some values preset. So this is a really nice way to make nested loggers where the where you have some logger that always includes data from the parent logger. So you can create a hierarchy of loggers. Um, loggers are also cloned, which is really nice. So what we want to do here is well, they're cloned if the underlying drain. So a logger is connected to a drain, and the drain is sort of where you output stuff. Um, and so what we're going to say in our case is we're going to use the default drain because we might as well. Uh, and we're going to say that a zookeeper has a logger, which is a slogger. Slogger. Why not? Uh, we're also going to have our proto mod contain a. Uh, this file has a lot of stuff now be broken up some more. Uh, new issue. Break up source proto mod into smaller files. It's getting ridiculous. It's a great issue of description. Probably going to end up hating myself for that, but it's fine. Alright, so we want on Packetizer. Where's our Packetizer? Not on Active Packetizer, but on Packetizer itself. Uh, what? Where's Packetizer? There we go. Logger uh, is a slog logger. I guess we want to use slog. Oh, and we also need to bring the logging macros in and a new. Well, that's a little awkward. So we sort of want the user to be able to specify the logger, but default to something that's just a drain. So, um, sorry to clarify. Um, there's a there's a logger that is called is it drain i think it's no where's the discard so a logger discard is just a thing that you log to and nothing happens um and so it, it makes a lot of sense for that to be the default logger in our case i think we just do log so logger as an argument to new like so and ooh, I guess exit logger is log.clone because now finally we can do info. Well, actually, no, this is an error. Uh, exit logger. Uh, the other thing that's nice about slog is you can have tagged fields. I don't actually use this right now, but you can do things like at the end, do like foo, it's like i, and, and it will be printed nicely and formatted if you have structured output and whatnot. Uh, for this though, we actually just want the, the printout. Right. And then I think what we want here is for active packetizer to also carry a logger around, probably. Um, just so we don't have to, well, we can just pass it in each time. The, there, there's some 
there's some advantage to having each packetizer have its own logger because then we could set fields for every logger, like for, for every packetizer, I mean, to say that like whenever an active packetizer prints, it also includes like it, its um, iteration ID or something so that we, we can tell if we go from reading the log output from one active packetizer to the log output from a different one. But I think we'll, we'll probably leave that alone for now. It's probably not terribly important. Um, so specifically, poll, poll. It's going to be logger. And take one of these. And we'll get back to actually making that work. Uh, it does mean the packetizer new down here. Third argument. It's getting long. Let's see. So we sort of want a like a connect with logger. This is where you get a builder, right? Um, so I guess we can do that. So pub struct zookeeper builder. Um, it's gonna have I guess session timeout is the other thing that we the session timeout we currently just like set to zero. And in theory, the user should be allowed to specify that. So session timeout, um, what is it an I32 probably? Yeah, I32. I guess this should really be a, because we have a good language, time duration. Uh, and what was the other thing we want to write? Like a logger. And we want to import default for zookeeper builder. Default. Nice. Catching a live stream. Woo! Always better to watch it live, I think. Unclear, actually. Uh, you tell me. So the session timeout is going to be zero by default. And the logger is going to be slog uh, discard. I think that's how you'd normally do it. Uh, the docs for this are not always great. Like there's a bunch of, like here are features we have, but I don't really care about the features. I want to see how to use it. Uh, discard. Yeah, you got to do this. All right. So this is how we create a discard logger. So the default is that we don't do any logging. And then zookeeper builder. It's going to be a this. Mm, I guess we'll probably move the handshake too. Because this might as well just be on builder. Um, Self. Then self. And this, I guess, can be clone. It's unclear that you want to be able to clone it, but you might as well have it be all of those useful things. Um, yep. So connect is just going to do that. It's going to move self handshake. Handshake is going to also take self. And it's going to get the adder. And then here, this is going to be uh, self.session timeout. And then I guess here, we'll get to do our first debug. Self.log. Well, self. Is it logger or log? Logger. Um, About to perform handshake. Great. Um, Packetizer new is going to be given the logger. And I guess here, uh, this is going to be a connection log. The self.logger.clone. And that's going to be here because we probably will want to uh, trace that. So if you enable trace output, 
you want to be able to see the um, connection. There. You want to be able to see the response to connect. Um, handshakes are not important enough that we want to always show them. So you should think of info as info is shown in release mode, debug is shown in debug mode, and trace is only shown if you turn it on. Um, all right, so now I guess we might still want to with default parameters uh, see zookeeper builder connect. So this is going to be zookeeper builder default dot connect adder. Like so. And now we don't need handshake there anymore. In theory, we could store a logger inside Zookeeper too. Or I guess we already decided we were gonna. Nice. Uh, in that case, how does it? Oh, this does not return a self. This returns a Zookeeper. This returns a Zookeeper. Um. Right. So we're gonna make this be key log, and then we're gonna have here, we're gonna put in the, the logger itself. Right, so we have one logger that we give away to the packetizer, which we're gonna spawn up in the background. And then we have another logger that we're gonna keep for the zookeeper instance, right? And now here, we're gonna do something like trace self.logger, uh, create and path is here path probably don't want to log the data probably want to include mode uh, it also has this nice thing where you can prefix something with a question mark to use the the debug the debug output of that value um, so we have that we have delete Version, uh, version. We have uh, here exists path, and this will just be watch, I guess, because we'll want to see that as well. And we don't need to log in the the sort of root the the leaf things because they all end up calling these. Uh, children and get data. I don't think there's that much left in this file. Nope. And so now the question is what we want to log in proto mod. So here we now have the logger inside the packetizer. So let's start at the bottom of the packetizer. Um, where is new? Right. So that just that's really just packetizer pull. That's sort of the main loop. Um, these we sort of need to decide how noisy we want debug output to be. Um, I think things like this are probably trace because that's not terribly important. Um, right. There are other things that will be important, like uh, uh, I guess you don't actually print that much here. Reconnection response is definitely a trace. Uh, about to handshake again. So this. There's probably an info here where we want to say like uh, uh, down here info um, connection lost reconnecting and then here we want to include the session ID and the last ZX ID because it may be relevant. We could include the password here too, but it's not terribly important. 
Also, I want Rust to start formatting macros, even though I know macros are hard to format. OK. Uh, and then I guess the rest of this really goes on in the state polling. So self.logger. I don't know if that matters. Uh, the name is S log, S L O G. It's this great. Or are you asking the. Oh, the. Yeah, yeah, it is this logging great. Um, poll. So this is given a logger, but crucially, this, I guess, is given a logger. And it calls this with the logger. For reconnecting, I guess we do need to include the logger. So where does reconnecting's poll go? Oh, actually, that doesn't need to do that at all. Great. Um, so the packetizers pull in queue, that's going to have to take the logger. Loggers just like end up everywhere. Uh, so this takes a logger, that's a mute ass log logger. Let's see. Uh, this is definitely a trace. I mean, so, got a request could be a debug, actually. Because uh, this is in queuing. Not really. Yep. In queuing requests, uh, this is, I mean, trace at best. I guess it could be debug, but no, it's probably trace. Um, great. Wait, why does it complain? Expect it. Oh, like so. E print line. Where do else do we have one of these? Right. So active packetizer. That's the one we want. So for active packetizer, we call pull. Uh, I think this pull read is not terribly important. This is going to be given the logger. Uh, I guess this is trace uh, sending heartbeat. Oh, I guess that's why. I guess we do need the the trace here to know that we're about to do a pull read to distinguish it from doing a pull write down here. And we want to pass the logger to pull write too. And then this should be debug logger. because it's useful to know when the packet exits. exits. Uh, and now I guess pull right, pull right takes a logger again, yes, log logger, well it's a mute, yes, log logger. And it will do, this is gonna be a trace. Uh, resetting heartbeat timer. So this is where we reset the heartbeat timer because we wrote something on the wire. Heartbeat is since last inactive. Since last wire traffic. Uh, this is debug. 
And then pull read, which is going to be where most of the logging will probably go. Oh, I see. Here we have a bunch of things just to even figure out where request boundaries are. I think these we probably don't even want to make um, logging statements. Um, could have this be trace. So we could do trace logger uh, need Uh, the other thing that's nice about slog is it compiles out any logging statements that um, are below the threshold of the current build mode. So, for example, if you're build compiling in release mode, all trace and debug statements will not even be compiled. So, like this computation of inland, for example, will not be computed. Uh, here... Uh, I think the bail is sufficient. Uh, this is probably a debug. Uh, server closed connection. This is not important. Uh, this is definitely a trace. Right, so this is updated ZXID from to um, this is a trace. Watcher events, I think we also want to trace. But notice how very few of these are actually debug, right? Um, so here, huh. I guess. That's another good question. This is going to be something like found waiting custom loggers, uh, watchers. Found potentially waiting custom watchers. Right? Because some of them might be for a different. Um, for a different event type. This is the fix we did earlier. I probably don't want to notify on every watch. Um, this is definitely a trace. Unclear that it's even important enough to uh, log, but probably. So here, this is where we get a response to a user request. Uh, handling server response. So here we certainly want to put out the XID and the opcode. Uh, the bigger question is whether we also want to print out the, uh, the contents of the response. I think we might actually uh, what did we make a uh, request oh, debug yeah so in queuing request is a debug so I feel like the response should then also be a debug I guess one question is whether we want to include the body of the response in the debug output too. Probably. 
Um, well, this is definitely a trace. question. I guess here not turn into real watcher. Here we probably want to include the error. And again because trace things are compiled out it's not a problem for us to include some like it's not even expensive, but just to include some additional information here, right? Um, what else do we want? Let's see. I do wonder whether we actually want to print out the response, but it's a little annoying to do so. Um, because it's not parsed until down here. I guess we could just move this whole thing down, right? Handling server error response, which would just be E. And then down here, we would do the same for handling server response. So that works pretty well. That gives us basically, I think, the debug response we want. Because here we might want to make this info. Like, this is an operation that failed. So it seems info worthy. Um, I don't think we need timeout. Uh, we may want to log the fact that we've set a timeout, though. Trace. Uh, negotiated session timeout. And that value is timeout. And what did we decide? It was millisecond. And I think that's most of it. Do we still have any print lines here? Nope. Do we have any here? Got through all futures. That's the part of testing. It's probably not going to compile because I probably missed something out. In fact, I know that the session timeout, this, it should be rust. Uh, Time. Time. Duration. Uh, I want sub. Ugh, that's awful. I want just into millis, and this is still not something that's here. So you need to compute it manually, which is pretty annoying. So it's this dot sx times. The thousand plus the subsec millis seems unhelpful. Six ten format argument must be a string literal. Right, these should not be like this. This should be xid is this. It should be path is this, and it should be w type is this. What? Logger. Ooh. Use of undeclared time. Well, we do need time, it's true. You are missing to logger in the macro. Oh yeah, sorry. There's a slight delay in the stream. Uh, and so I, by the time I saw your comment, I'd already fixed it, but thanks. Uh, 128. 
this is just going to be self.logger. 77. Time duration new zero. Uh, oh, I guess, right. So the crucially, the thing we need here is we need the ability to set these values. Otherwise, it doesn't really work. This is going to be a pub fn set timeout, which is going to be a t Can this just take a mute self? No, I'm just going to. There, there's a lot of discussion about exactly how the builder pattern should work out. There's an argument for the best thing is if your builder can be this. Um, that's a little tough for us. Or, sorry, if your pattern can be this. Uh, and then your build can be this. Um, in our case, that's a little awkward, so I don't really want to do it. Um, because it would require that the pointer is static, which is all sorts of mess messed up, um, so that people can chain builders. In instead, I think we're just going to take mute self for now, something we could optimize. But So session timeout is T. And similarly, we want to set logger, where L is an S log logger. Because now, in down here, uh, builder is zookeeper builder default. And then we're going to do builder dot set logger. And now we're going to steal one of these S log loggers, specifically, uh, where is it? Yeah, we need, we need to pull in a bunch of crates, which is a little sad. Um, Oops. So this is going to be uh, only in debug mode. Well, only in test mode, actually. So we're going to have dev dependencies. And those are going to be slog async. And slog term. Because now we can use the, where is it? This business to make our logger. So this is going to be logger. I guess we can just do this. And then this becomes builder. If you aren't doing anything special, why are you using setters rather than modifying the struct fields? Or have I missed out on something? Um, I don't like to make fields pub. Uh, whether that's a good thing or a bad thing is unclear. Um, but the, the test, like, I don't really want to mark these two fields as pub, right? In theory, I could, I guess, so that you can read them out as well. I just have like a, an aversion to doing so. Um, the other reason is because it's easier, well, yeah, I mean, it's a good question. Um, I guess one of the reasons to do this is because it means that I can imagine that later I wanted to change session timeout to like, just hold an I32 directly, right? Then I can still present the same external API of taking a duration, but then just store it as an I32 internally. If I give make the fields pub, then I'm I'm committing to this being the context of builder. The other reason I don't want to do it is because um, it's totally reasonable for us to want to add more fields to builder later. That would then be a backwards incompatible change because if these fields are public, it means that people might be matching on Zookeeper builder, which I don't want them to do. Um, well, let's see. Wait, why is it complaining about this? Oh, yeah, that's wrong. Uh, this. So, 
still gonna yell at me somewhere, but. Um, 130. U64 found U32. So I would want this to be as I32, and I want this to be as I32. Oh, it's like logger not send or something. Spawn. Wait, this has never been a problem before. What did I change? Yeah, so I mean, it's a, it's a good question. Um, in Java, you definitely do getters and setters everywhere. I often don't even do getters. Where in the builder pattern specifically, I only do setters. Not for any good reason, it's just usually the setters are all you need. I do like not exposing the fields directly because it means that you can change them. Um, I think that's generally a good pattern. Um, and especially in a, in a language like Rust where you have pattern matching too, on top of this, right? Um, I wonder why it's saying that this has changed. It's got to be that logger is not send. Oh, no, it is not. It is because this has to be logger.clone. And then it has to move in this so that's fine and then it's complaining in 707 oh actually it's really this but this needs to just be log now where does it complain 492 oh 492 Right, this is because I need to use as log drain uh, opcode 461. Really? Use of moved value opcode. But opcode should be copy. Why did it not warn me about that? It's annoying. Oh, we're almost there. 643. Cannot borrow it mutably more than once at a time. Where is it already borrowed? need to take a logger it already has the logger in self and same down here oh this should probably say the xid it's going to enqueue it with Allows creating more customized. Allows customizing options for zookeeper connections. Uh huh. And these, of course, the session expiry timeout. See, that's just like an unhelpful comment. Arguably, there should be a link here to something like, uh, where's the FAQ that I found here? Uh, really, they don't have direct links to this. 
That seems false. Actually, I guess in theory it should be here, right? It should link to sessions. That's a lot more helpful. Uh, logging instance to use. Uh, the default timeout is dictated by the server. Uh, defaults are always something that like should be documented more than aren't. Um, used internally in the zookeeper client. By default, all logging is disabled. And I guess also, I sort of want to link to the docs. See also. Documentation. That's not that URL. All right, how about now? Let's see what it gives us. That's beautiful, beautiful. So notice now it's not inclu including any of the uh, trace output. So what I like to do is there's a, the way to turn that on is by saying features is a max level, max debug level trace, I think. Oh. So I like to have that line commented out so that it's easy to add again. Uh, oh, what's it called? Slog, what's the name of the feature? Max level trick. Max level trace, really? Do you like seeing other people program in Rust as I get to see very different styles to programming? As I'd said, mine is quite different. But then again, the only sizable Rust project I have is my MSC project, so I don't really have to worry about other people ever using it. I mean, that's true. Um, I do think that they're, seeing other people code is like interesting in its own way. Uh, right, so here, notice here, there's now a bunch of trace output, right? And all of that is normally just hidden. Oh, that's interesting. Dropping messages due to channel overflow. Wow. It's, uh, I don't think I've seen that before. Really? I feel like there's a better way to do this, but it's not important enough for me to care. Uh, at least this means that we have all the tracing that we need. So I'll, I'll pop this back to this. Um, it's a little annoying actually that it's not easy for users of this library to then turn on max level trace for slog. And I don't know how to fix that. Um, I think I asked the developer at some point and he didn't have a good idea. All right, so all of this to say that we now have logging. Add support for logging. Great. Good push. Also, let's do a cargo publish. It's like version 0 0.1. Oh, it might complain about all sorts of other things. Because this file, I guess, uh, vim, well, vim diff, uh, dev, uh, minor fantasini, probably. Let's see what kind of things we're missing. So we need this. Asynchronous client library for interacting with Apache Zookeeper. 
implementation is going to be a docs on our RS, Tokyo Zookeeper. Uh, I, guess, I don't think we even need to set that anymore, actually. Uh huh. Oh, I guess we'll have to figure out what keywords are going to be things like uh, Zookeeper. Tokyo, asynchronous. I also found out that recently about crates.io slash category slugs, which is basically the page I wanted last time. Because we want categories. Uh, API bindings. Uh, what else? It's not really a database. Arguably, it's a, it is a database because it's a key value store, but let's uh, ignore that for now. What else? Network programming, I, I guess. I think that's true. Um, arguably not web programming. <laughs> I think the game is to just include as many as possible. Well, sort of. There's actually an upper limit. You can't publish if you if there are more than seven or something. I ran into this unintentionally. Uh, we don't have Travis yet. I did not try to categorize it with all the categories, but it just wouldn't, uh, wouldn't let me. Uh, I guess there's still we still don't really have any top level crate implement uh, documentation, but that's something I'll add later. Uh, commit am better cargo toml. Oh, I guess I also need to do this. So we get push, and then we do cargo publish. Uh, allow dirty so that it doesn't complain about my Travis email file. Have they mentioned that category stuff publicly? I've never heard of that part of the site before now. I know, I hadn't heard of it before either. Um, but there's a pull request that just landed that means that it will now be listed somewhere here. List of category slugs. It's now under docs. It did not used to be. It was added like in the last week. But it has apparently existed for a very long time. It's just like no one knew about it. Uh, all right, docs.rs slash Tokyo Zookeeper. Probably hasn't been built yet. But in theory, should be there pretty soon. Ooh, types of chunk of memory. Build it faster. Build it faster. Build it faster. Build it faster. Um, that's pretty cool, though. I think we're in a pretty good place now. Um, what I'll do is also uh, go through the GitHub issues and tag them for like things that are beginner friendly. I think many of them should be pretty straightforward to like dive into and try to implement yourself if you like want a challenge. Um, and I'm happy to review pull requests in general. While we wait for this to finish, um, I think we'll basically finish up here. I don't think there's too much more. I wanted to cover um, multi-server connections Sadly, we did not really get time for that. It's also a little bit tricky to test because I didn't find a good, efficient way of running many servers on one machine in like a way that's not super annoying. Um, so that, that's still something that's like a relatively major to do, but it's, it's also somewhat uninteresting from the asynchronous part of things. So I think at this point, I probably won't do more live streams on Tokyo Zookeeper unless there are questions. I'll still continue fiddling with the crate, but, but I'll probably do that more in my own time. Um, and so if you have ideas for other things you'd like to see me do, um, then reach out either in chat now, on Twitter, on Patreon, any of the other places. Um, like I love getting ideas for this kind of stuff. Um, the last thing I toyed with was doing some kind of standard library data structures. So we did um, a hash map a little while ago using like a linked hash map, which has turned out to be quite popular. And so I could do something like that that's sort of a little bit more introductory Rust, but also pretty interesting. Um, or we could do some other crate that's asynchronous. There's a bunch of other ideas there. Um, so if you have ideas, feel free to reach out. 
or, or email me for that matter. Oh, why is this not building? Uh, I'll be gone for the next like four weeks probably. And so it'll be a while until the next stream, but all the recordings for the past streams are online. So you could watch those if you haven't already. Uh, I'll post this as soon as we're, um, as soon as I finish recording. I want to, there we go. Tokyo Zookeeper. Woo! We have a thing that's out. That's fantastic. I think we might want to clean up some of the structs, like maybe put some of the like ACL and stat under a module or something. Let's see how this generally looks. It's uh, decently respectable. Decently respectable. I guess here there's a bunch of documentation we haven't done because the stat and ACL we've just copied from the synchronous zookeeper stuff. Um, but it's a good start. All right. Uh, thanks for hanging out with me and, uh, and writing, uh, writing zookeeper stuff. It's been fun. Um, if you, uh, yeah, I didn't mention this. If you have like feedback about the streams as well, uh, then I'd love to hear that. There've been people who pointed out that, uh, some of the pages I visit are too white, which actually makes a lot of sense. Like I'm switching back and forth between dark and light windows. Um, or like some people wanted larger font sizes, um, any of those kind of things, just reach out um, and I'll try to do my best. Thanks for watching. And uh, feel free to try to address things in the repo if you want. I'm happy to review pull requests. All right, bye everyone.